<laughs> You've caught me. I was just having a look at your copy of Selected Stories of Franz Kafka. You don't mind if I... What, to be read aloud? Well, that's certainly a task. I... I'd be flattered to try, certainly. Now. Well, all right. Um, <clears throat> page three of Kafka's selected short stories, The Judgment. It was a Sunday morning in the very height of spring. George Bendman, a young merchant, was sitting in his own room on the first floor of one of a long row of small ramshackle houses stretching beside the river, which were scarcely distinguishable from each other except in height and coloring. He had just finished a letter to an old friend of his, who was now living abroad, had put it into its envelope in a slow and dreamy fashion, and with his elbows propped on the writing table was gazing out of the window at the river, the bridge, and the hills on the farther bank with their tender green. He was thinking about his friend, who had actually run away to Russia some years before, being dissatisfied with his prospects at home. Now he was carrying on a business in St. Petersburg, which had flourished to begin with but a long, uh, with, <laughs> which had flourished to begin with, but had long been going downhill, as he always, always complained on his increasingly rare visits. So he was wearing himself out to no purpose in a foreign country. The unfamiliar full beard he wore did not quite conceal the face George had known so well since childhood, and his skin was growing so yellow as to indicate some latent disease. By his own account, he had no regular connection with the colony of his fellow countrymen out there, and almost no social intercourse with Russian families, so that he was resigning himself to becoming a permanent bachelor. What could one write to such a man who had obviously run off the rails, a man one could be sorry for, but could not help? Should one advise him to come home, to transplant himself, and take up his old friendships again? There was nothing to hinder him, and in general to rely on the help of his friends, <laughs> but that was as good as telling him, and the more kindly, the more offensively, that all his efforts hitherto had miscarried that he should finally give up, come back home, and be gaped at by everyone as a returned prodigal, that only his friends knew what was what, and that he himself was just a big child who should do what his successful and home-keeping friends prescribed. And was it certain, besides, that all the pain one would have to inflict on him would achieve its object? Perhaps it would not even be possible to get him to come home at all. He said himself that he was now out of touch with commerce in his native country. And then he would still be left an alien in a foreign land, embittered by his friend's advice and more than ever estranged from them. But if he did follow their advice and then didn't fit in at home, not out of malice, of course, but through force of circumstances, couldn't get on with his friends or without them, felt humiliated, couldn't be said to have either friends or a country of his own any longer, wouldn't it have been better for him to stay abroad just as he was? Taking all this into account, how could one be sure that he would make a success of life at home? For such reasons, supposing one wanted to keep up correspondence with him, one could not send him any real news such as could frankly be told to the most distant acquaintance. It was more than three years since his last visit and for this he offered the lame excuse that the political situation in Russia was too uncertain, which apparently would not permit even the briefest absence of a small businessman while it allowed hundreds of thousands of Russians to travel peacefully abroad. But during these three years, George's own possession, position in life had changed a lot. Two years ago, his mother had died. Since when he and his father had shared the household together, and his friend had, of course, been informed of that and had expressed his sympathy in a letter phrased so dryly that the grief caused by such an event, one had to conclude, could not be realized in a distant country. <laughs> Since that time, however, George had applied himself with greater determination to the business as well as to everything else. 
Perhaps during his mother's lifetime, his father's insistence on having everything his own way in the business had hindered him from developing any real activity of his own. Perhaps since her death, his father had become less aggressive, although he was still active in the business. Perhaps it was mostly due to an accidental run of good fortune, which was probable, which was very probable indeed. But at any rate, during those two years, the business had developed in a most unexpected way. The staff had had to be uh, doubled. <laughs> the staff had had to be doubled. The turnover was five times as great, no doubt about it. Further progress lay just ahead. But George's friend had no inkling of this improvement. In earlier years, perhaps for the last time in that letter of condolence, he had tried to persuade George to emigrate to Russia and had enlarged upon the prospects of success for precisely George's branch of trade. The figures quoted were microscopic by comparison with the range of George's present operations, yet he shrank from letting his friend know about his business success. And if he were to do it now retrospectively, that certainly would look peculiar. So George confined himself to giving his friend unimportant items of gossip, such as rise at random in the memory when one is idly thinking things over on a quiet Sunday. All he desired was to leave undisturbed the idea of the hometown which his friend must have built up in his own content during the long interval. And so it happened to George that three times in three fairly widely separated letters, he had told his friend about the en engagement of an unimportant man to an equally unimportant girl, until indeed, quite contrary to his intentions, his friend began to show some interest in this notable event. Yet George preferred to write about things like these rather than to confess that he himself had got engaged a month ago to a Fraulein Frida Brandenfeld, a girl from a well-to-do family. He often discussed this friend of his with his fiancée and the peculiar relationship that had developed between them in their correspondence. So he won't be coming to our wedding, said she, and yet I have a right to get to know all your friends. I don't want to trouble him, answered George. Don't misunderstand me. He would probably come, at least I think so, but he would feel that his hand had been forced, and he would be hurt. Perhaps he would envy me, and certainly, he, and certainly he'd be discontented, and without being able to do anything about the, his discontent, he'd have to go away again, alone, alone. Do you know what that means? Yes, but may he not hear about our wedding in some other fashion? I can't prevent that, of course, but it's unlikely, considering the way he lives. Since your friends are like that, George, you shouldn't ever have gotten engaged at all. Well, we're both to blame for that, but I wouldn't have it any other way now. And when, breathing quickly under his kisses, she still brought out, all the same, I do feel upset. He thought it could not really involve him in trouble were he to send the news to his friend. That's the kind of man I am, and he'll just have to take me as I am. He said to himself, I can't cut myself to another pattern that might make a more suitable friend for him. And in fact, he did inform his friend in the long letter he had been writing that Sunday morning about his engagement with these words, I have saved my best news to the end. I have got engaged to a Fraulein Frida Brandenfeld, a girl from a well-to-do family who only came to live here a long time after you went away, so that you're hardly likely to know her. There will be time to tell you more about her later, for today let me just say that I am very happy, and as between you and me, the only difference in our relationship is that instead of a quite ordinary kind of friend, you will now have in me a happy friend. Besides that, you will acquire in my fiance, who sends her warm greetings and will soon write you herself, a genuine friend of the opposite sex, which is not without importance to a bachelor. I know that there are many reasons why you can't come to see us, but would not my wedding be precisely the right occasion for giving all obsta obstacles, <laughs> obstacles the go by? Still, however that may be, do just as seems good to you without regarding any interests but your own. With this letter in his hand, George had been sitting a long time at the writing table, his face turned towards the window. He had barely acknowledged, with an absent smile, a greeting waved to him from the street 
by a passing acquaintance. At last he put the letter in his pocket and went out of his room across a small lobby into his father's room, which he had not entered for months. There was, in fact, no need for him to enter it, since he saw his father daily at business, and they took their midday meal together at an eating house. In the evening, it was true, each did as he pleased, yet even then, unless George, as most happened, went out with friends, or more recently visited his fiancée, they always sat for a while, each with his newspaper, in their common sitting room. It surprised George how dark his father's room was, even on this sunny morning, so it was overshadowed as much as that by the high wall on the other side of the narrow courtyard. His father was sitting by the window in a corner hung with various mementos of George's dead mother, reading a newspaper which he held to one side before his eyes in an attempt to overcome a defect of vision. On the table stood the remains of his breakfast, not much of which seemed to have been eaten. Ah, Georges, said his father, rising at once to meet him. His heavy dressing gown swung open as he walked and the skirts of it fluttered around him. My father is still a giant of a man, said George to himself. It's unbearably dark here, he said aloud. Oh, no, it's unbearably dark here, he said aloud. Yes, it's dark enough, answered his father. And you've shut the window too? I prefer it like that. Well, it's quite warm outside, said George, as if continuing his previous remark and sat down. His father cleared away the breakfast dishes and set them on a chest. I really only wanted to tell you, went on George, who had been vacantly following the old man's movements, that I am now sending the news of my engagement to St. Petersburg. He drew the letter a little way from his pocket and let it drop back again. To St. Petersburg? asked his father. To my friend there, said George, trying to meet his father's eye. In business hours, he's quite different. He was thinking how solidly he sits here with his arms crossed. Oh, yes, do your friend, said his father with peculiar emphasis. Well, you know, father, that I wanted not to tell him about my engagement at first out of consideration for him. That was the only reason. You know yourself, he's a difficult man. I said to myself that someone else might tell him about my engagement, although he's such a solitary creature that that was hardly likely. I couldn't prevent that, but I wasn't ever going to tell him myself. And now you have changed your mind? Asked his father, laying his enormous newspaper on the windowsill, and on top of it, his spectacles, which he covered with one hand. Yes, I've been thinking it over. If he's a good friend of mine, I said to myself, my being happily engaged should make him happy too. And so I wouldn't put off telling him any longer. But before I posted the letter, I wanted to let you know. Josh, said his father, lengthening his toothless mouth. Listen to me. You've come to me about this business to talk it over with me. No doubt that does you honor. But it's nothing. It's worth then nothing. If you don't tell me the whole truth, I don't want to stir up matters that shouldn't be mentioned here. Since the death of our dear mother, certain things have been done that aren't right. Maybe the time will come for mentioning them, and maybe sooner, and maybe sooner than we think. There are many a thing in the business I'm not aware of. Maybe it's done behind my back. I'm not going to say it's done behind my back. I'm not equal to things any longer. My memory is failing. I haven't an eye for so many things any longer. That's the course of nature in the first place. (laughs) In the first place. And in the second place, the death of our dear mother hit me harder than it did you. But since we are talking about it, about this letter, I beg you, George, don't deceive me. It's a trivial affair. It's hardly worth mentioning, so don't deceive me. Do you really have this friend in St. Petersburg? George rose in embarrassment. Never mind, my friends, 
a thousand friends wouldn't make up to me for my father. Do you know what I think? You're not taking enough care of yourself. But old age must be taken care of. I can't do without you in the business. You know that very well. But if the business is going to undermine your health, I'm ready to close it down tomorrow forever. And that won't do. We'll have to make a change in your way of living. But a radical change. You sit here in the dark. And in the sitting room, you would have plenty of light. You just take a bite of breakfast. Instead, you properly, instead of properly keeping up your strength, you sit by a closed window and the air would be so good for you. No, father, I'll get the doctor to come and we'll fo follow his orders. We'll change your room. You can move into the front room and I'll move in here. You won't notice the change. All your things will be moved with you, but there's time for all that later. I'll put you to bed now for a little. I'm sure you need to rest. Come, I'll help you to take off your things. You'll see I can do it. Or if you would rather go into the front room at once, you can lie down in my bed for the present. That would be the most sensible thing. George stood close beside his father, who had let his head with its unkempt white hair sink on his chest. George, said his father in a low voice without moving. George knelt down at once beside his father. In the old man's weary face, he saw the pupils over large, fixedly looking at him from the corners of his eyes. You have a friend in St. Petersburg. You've always been a leg beller, and you haven't even shrunk from pulling my leg. How could you have a friend out there? I can't believe it. <laughs> Just think back a bit, father, said George, lifting his father from the chair and slipping off his dressing gown as he stood feebly enough. It'll soon be three years since my friend came to see us last. I remember that you used to not like him very much. At least twice I kept you from seeing him, although he was actually sitting with me in my room. I could quite well understand your dislike of him. My friend has his peculiarities. But then later you got on with him very well. I was proud because you listened to him and nodded and asked him questions. If you think back, you're bound to remember. He used to tell us the most incredible stories of the Russian Revolution. For instance, when he was on a business trip to Kiev and ran into a riot and saw a priest on a balcony who cut a broad cross in blood on the palm of his hand and held the hand up and appealed to the mob. You've told that story yourself once or twice since. Meanwhile, George had succeeded in lowering his father down again and carefully taking off the woolen drawers he wore over his linen underpants and his socks. The not particularly clean appearance of this underwear made him reproach himself for having been neglectful. It should have certainly been his duty to see that his father had clean changes of underwear. He had not yet explicitly discussed with his bride-to-be what arrangements should be made for his father in the future, for they had both of them silently taken it for granted that the old man would go on living alone in the old house. But now he made a quick, firm decision to take him into his own future establishment. It almost looked, on closer inspection, as if the care he meant to lavish there on his father might come too late. He carried his father to bed in his arms. It gave him a dreadful feeling to notice that while he took the few steps towards the bed, the old man on his breast was playing with his watch chain. He could not lay him down on the bed for a moment. So firmly did he hang on to the watch chain. But as soon as he was laid in bed, all seemed well. He covered himself up and even drew the blanket farther than usual over his shoulders. He looked up at George with a not unfriendly eye. You begin to remember my friend, don't you? Asked George, giving him an encouraging nod. Am I well covered up now? Asked his father, as if he were not able to see whether his feet were properly tucked in or not. So you find it snug in bed already, said George, and tucked the blankets more closely around him. Am I well covered up? Asked the father once more seeming to be strangely intent upon the answer. Don't worry, you're well covered up. No, cried his father, cutting short the answer. Threw the blankets off with a strength that seemed, that sent them all flying in a moment and sprang erect in bed. Only one hand lightly touched the ceiling to steady him. You wanted to cover me up? I know, my young sprig but I'm far from being covered up yet. And even 
if this is their last last strength <laughs> strength I have is enough for you too much for you of course I know your friend he would have been a son after my own heart that's why you've been playing him false all these years why else do you think I haven't been sorry for him and that's why you had to lock yourself up in your office the chief is busy mustn't be disturbed just so that you can write your lying little letters to Russia but thank goodness your father doesn't need to be taught how to see through a son son <laughs> and now that you thought you'd got him down so far down that you could set your bottom on him and sit on him and he wouldn't move then my fine son makes up his mind to get married george stared at the bogey conjured up by his father his friend in saint petersburg whom his father suddenly knew too well touched his imagination as never before lost in the vastness of russia he saw him at the door of an empty plundered warehouse he saw him among the wreckage of his showcases, the slashed remnants of his wares, the falling gas brackets, he was just standing up. Why did he have to go so far away? But attend to me, cried his father. And George, almost distracted, ran towards the bed to take everything in, yet came to a stop halfway. Because she lifted up our skirts, his father began to flute. Because she lifted did the Perscots like this, the nasty creature? And mimicking her, he lifted his shirt so high that one could see the scar on his thigh from his war wound. Because she lifted up her skirt like this, and this you made up to her, and in order to make free with her undisturbed, you had disgraced your mother's memory, betrayed your friend, and stuck your father into bed so that he can't move. But he can move, or can't he, <laughs> or, or can't he? Um, and he stood up quite unsupported and kicked his legs out. His insight made him radiant. George shrank into a corner as far away from his father as possible. A long time ago, he had firmly made up his mind to watch closely every least movement so that he should not be surprised by an indirect attack. Ah, uh, a long time ago, he had firmly made up his mind to watch closely every least movement so that he should not be surprised by any indirect attack, a pounce from behind or above. At this moment, he recalled this long forgotten resolve and forgot it again, like a man drawing a short thread through an eye of a needle. But your friend hasn't been betrayed after all, cried his father, emphasizing the point with stabs of his forefinger. I've been representing him here on this spot. You comedian, George could not resist the retort, realized at once the harm done, and his eyes starting in his head, hit, bit his tongue back only too late till the pain made his knees give. Yes, of course I've been playing a comedy. A comedy, that's a good expression. Oh. Yes, of course I've been playing a comedy. A comedy, that's a good expression. What other comfort was left to a poor old widower? Tell me. And while you are answering me, be you still my living son? What else was left to me in a back room plagued by a disloyal staff, old to the marrow of my bones, and my son strutting through the world, finishing off deals that I had prepared for him? bursting with triumph and glee, and stalking away from his father with the closed face of a respectable business man. <laughs> Do you think I didn't love you, I, from whom you are sprung? Now he'll lean forward, thought George. What if he topples and smashes himself? These words went hissing through his mind. His father leaned forward, but did not topple. Since George did not come any nearer, as he had expected, he straightened himself again. Stay where you are. I don't need you. You think you have strength enough to come over here and that you are only hanging back of your own accord 
don't be too sure. I'm still much the stronger of us two. All by myself, I might have had to give way, but your mother has given me so much of her strength that I've established a fine connection with your friend, and I have your customers here in my pocket. He has pockets even in his shirt, said George to himself, and believed that with this remark he could make him an impossible figure for all the world. Only for a moment did he think so, since he kept on forgetting everything. Just take your bride on your arm and try getting in my way. I'll sweep her from your very side. You don't know how. George made a grimace of disbelief. His father only nodded, confirming the truth of his words towards George's corner. How you amused me today coming to ask me if you should tell your friend about your engagement. He knows it already, you stupid boy. He knows it all. I've been writing to him, for you forgot to take my writing things from me. That is why, that's why he hasn't been here for years. He knows everything a hundred times better than you do yourself. Yourself. In his left hand, he crumples your letters unopened, while in his right hand, he holds up my letters to read through. In his enthusiasm, he waved his arm over his head. He knows everything a thousand times better, he cried. Ten thousand times, said George, to make fun of his father. But in his very mouth, the words turned into deadly earnest. For years, I've been waiting for you to come with such a question. Do you think I concern myself with anything else? Do you think I read newspapers? Look! And he threw George a newspaper sheet, which he had somehow taken to bed with him. An old newspaper, with a name entirely unknown to George. How long a time you've taken to grow up? Your mother had to die. She couldn't see their happy day. Your friend is going to pieces in Russia. Even three years ago, <laughs> it was yellow enough to be thrown away. And as for me, you see what condition I'm in? You have eyes in your head for that? So you've been lying in wait for me, cried George. His father said pityingly in an offhand manner. I suppose you wanted to say that sooner, but now it doesn't matter. And in a louder voice. So now you know what else there was in the world besides yourself. Till now you've known only about yourself. An innocent child, yes, that you were truly, but still more truly, you have been a devilish human being. And therefore, take note, I sentence you now to death by drowning. George felt himself urged from the room. The crash with which his father fell on the bed behind him was still in his ears as he fled. On the staircase, which he rushed down as if its steps were an inclined plane, he ran into his charwoman on her way up to do the morning cleaning of the room. Jesus, she cried, and covered her face with her apron, but he was already gone. Out of the front door he rushed, across the roadway, driven towards the water, Already he was grasping at the railings as a starving man clutches food. He swung himself over like the distinguished gymnast he had once been in his youth to his parents' pride. With weakening grip, he was still holding on when he spied between the railings a motor bus coming, which would easily cover the noise of his fall. Called in a low voice, Dear parents, I have always loved you all the same. And let himself drop. At this moment, an un... An unending stream of traffic was just going over the bridge. Is that a suicide? I'm not sure. I'd have to listen back. You, you all ready for the centerpiece, Metamorphosis? This is the famous one. I'm going to go all out, try not to do any more accents, because that was very difficult. Fun for me. I don't know if it was fun for you or not. The Metamorphosis. One. 
As Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a gigantic insect. He was lying on his hard, as it were, armor-plated back. And when he lifted his head a little, he could see his dome-like brown belly divided into stiff, arched segments, on top of which the bed quilt could hardly keep in position and was about to slide off completely. His numerous legs, which were pitifully thin compared to the rest of his bulk, waved helplessly before his eyes. What has happened to me? he thought. It was no dream. His room, a regular human bedroom, only rather too small, lay quiet between the four familiar walls. Above the table on which a collection of cloth samples was unpacked and spread out, Samsa was a commercial traveler, hung the picture which he had recently cut out of an illustrated magazine and put into a pretty gilt frame. It showed a lady with a fur cap on and a fur stole, sitting upright and holding out to the spectator a huge fur muff into which the whole of her forearm her forearm had vanished. Gregor's eyes turned next to the window and the overcast sky. One could hear raindrops beating on the window gutter. It made him quite melancholy. What about sleeping a little longer and forgetting all this nonsense, he thought. But it could not be done, for he was accustomed to sleep on his right side, and in his present condition he could not turn himself over. However violently he forced himself towards his right side, he always rolled onto his back again. He tried it at least a hundred times, shutting his eyes to keep from seeing his struggling legs, and only desisted when he began to feel in his side a faint dull ache he had never experienced before. Oh God, he thought, what an exhausting job I've picked on. Traveling about day in, day out, it's much more irritating work than doing the actual business in the office. And on top of that, there's the trouble of constant traveling, of worrying about train connections, the bed and irregular meals, casual acquaintances that are always new and never become intimate friends. The devil take it all. He felt a slight itching up on his belly, slowly pushed himself on his back nearer to the top of the bed so that he could lift his head more easily identified the itching place, which was surrounded by many small white spots, the nature of which he could not understand and made to touch it with a leg, but drew the leg back immediately for the contact made a cold shiver run through him. He slid down again into his former position. This getting up early, he thought, makes one quite stupid. A man needs his sleep. Other commercials live like harem win women, for instance. When I come back to the hotel of a morning to write up the orders I've got, these others are only sitting down to breakfast. Let me just try that with my chief. I'd be sacked on the spot. Anyhow, that might be quite a good thing for me. Who can tell? If I didn't have to hold my hand because of the parents I'd have given notice long ago, I'd have gone to the chief and told him exactly what I think of him. That would knock him endways from his desk. It's a queer way of doing, too, this sitting on high at a desk and talking down to employees, especially when they have to come quite near because the chief is hard of hearing. Well, there's still hope. Once I've saved enough money to pay back my parents' debts to him, that should take another five or six years. I'll do it without fail. I'll cut myself completely loose then. For the moment, though, I'd better get up, since my train goes at five. He looked at the alarm clock ticking on the chest. Heavenly Father, he thought, it was half past six o'clock, and the hands were quietly moving on. It was even past the half hour. It was getting on toward a quarter to seven. Had the alarm clock not gone off from the bed, one could see that it had been properly set for four o'clock. Of course, it must have gone off, yes, but was it possible to sleep quietly through that ear-splitting noise? Well, he had not slept quietly, yet apparently all the more soundly for that, but what was he to do now? The next, chain, the next train went at seven o'clock. To catch that, he would need to hurry like mad, and his samples weren't even packed up, and he himself wasn't feeling particularly fresh and active. And even if he did catch the train, he wouldn't avoid a row with the chief, since the firm's porter would have been waiting for the five o'clock train and would have been long since reported his failure to turn up. And would have long since reported his failure to turn up. 
The porter was a creature of the chiefs, spineless and stupid. Well, supposing he were to say that he was sick, but that would be almost, would be most unpleasant and would look suspicious since during his five years employment, he had not been ill once. The chief himself would be sure to come with the sick insurance doctor, uh, would reproach his parents with their son's laziness and would cut all excuses short by referring to the insurance doctor who of course regarded all mankind as perfectly healthy m m malingerers and would he be so far wrong on this occasion gregor really felt quite well apart from a drowsiness that was utterly superfluous after such a long sleep and he was even unusually hungry as all this was running through his mind at top speed without his being able to decide to leave his bed, the alarm clock had just struck a quarter to seven. There came a cautious tap at the door behind the head of his bed. Gregor, said a voice. It was his mother's. It's a quarter to seven. Hadn't you a train to catch? That gentle voice. Gregor had a shock as he heard his own voice answering hers. Unmistakably his own voice, it was true, but with a persistent horrible twittering squeak behind it, like an undertone that left the words in their clear shape only for the first moment, and then rose up reverberating round them to destroy their sense so that one could not be sure one had heard them rightly. Gregor wanted to answer at length and explain everything, but in the circumstances he confined himself to saying, yes, yes, thank you, mother, I'm getting up now. The wooden door between them must have kept the change in his voice from being noticeable outside, for his mother contented herself with this statement and shuffled away. Yet this brief exchange of words had made the other members of the family aware that Gregor was still in the house, as they had not expected, and at one of the side doors his father was already knocking, gently, yet with his fist. Gregor, Gregor, he called, what's the matter with you? And after a little while he called again in a deeper voice, Gregor, Gregor. At the other side of the door his sister was saying in a low, plaintive tone, Gregor, aren't you well? Are you needing anything? He answered them both at once. I'm just ready, and did his best to make his voice sound as normal as possible by enunciating the words very clearly and leaving long pauses between them. So his father went back to his breakfast, but his sister whispered, Gregor, open the door, do. However, he was not thinking of opening the door and felt thankful to the for the prudent habit he had acquired in traveling of locking all doors during the night, even at home. His immediate intention was to get up quietly without being disturbed, to put on his clothes, and above all, eat his breakfast, and only then to consider what else was to be done. Since in bed he was well aware his meditations would come to no sensible conclusion, he remembered that often enough in bed he had felt small aches and pains probably caused by awkward postures, which had proved purely imaginary once he got up and he looked forward eagerly to seeing this morning's delusions gradually fall away. That the change in his voice was nothing but the precursor of a severe chill, a standing ailment of commercial travelers, he had not the least possible doubt. To get rid of the quilt was quite easy. He had only to inflate himself a little, and it fell off by itself. But the next move was difficult, especially because he was so uncommonly broad. He would have needed arms and hands to hoist himself up. Instead, he had only the numerous little legs which never stopped waving in all directions and which he could not control in the least. When he tried to bend one of them, it was the first to stretch itself straight, and he did succeed at last in making it do what he wanted. All the other legs, meanwhile, waved the more wildly in a high degree of unpleasant agitation. But what's the use of lying idle in bed, said Gregor to himself. He thought he might get out of bed with the lower part of his body first, but this lower part, which he had not yet seen, and of which he could form no clear conception, proved too difficult to move. It shifted so slowly, and when finally almost wild with annoyance, he gathered his forces together and thrust out recklessly, he had miscalculated and the direction miscalculated the direction and bumped heavily against the lower end of the bed, and the stinging pain he felt informed him that precisely, precisely this lower part of his body was at the moment probably the most sensitive. So he tried to get to the top part of himself, get the top part of himself out first, and cautiously moved his head towards the edge of the bed. That proved easy enough, and despite its breadth, and mass, the bulk of his body at least, slowly followed the movement of his head. Still, 
When he finally got his head free over the edge of the bed, he felt too scared to go on advancing, for after all, if he let himself fall in this way, it would take a miracle to keep his head from being injured, and at all costs he must not lose consciousness now, precisely now, he would rather stay in bed. But when after a repetition of the same efforts, uh, but when after a repetition of the same efforts, he lay in his former position again, sighing, and watched his little legs struggling against each other, more wildly than ever, if that were possible, and saw no way of bringing any order into this arbitrary confusion, he told himself again that it was impossible to stay in bed, and that the most sensible course was to risk everything for the smallest hope of getting away from it. At the same time, he did not forget, meanwhile, to remind himself that cool reflection, the coolest possible, was much better than desperate resolves. In such moments, he focused his eyes as sharply as possible on the window, but unfortunately the prospect of the morning fog, which muffled even the other side of the narrow street, brought him little encouragement and comfort. Seven o'clock already, he said to himself when the alarm clock chimed again. Seven o'clock already, and still such a thick fog. And for a little while he lay quiet, breathing lightly, as if perhaps expecting such complete repose to restore all things to their real and normal condition. But then he said to himself, before it strikes a quarter past seven, I must be quite out of this bed, without fail. Anyhow, by that time, someone will have come from the office to ask for me, since it opens before seven. And he set himself to rocking his whole body at once in a regular rhythm, with the idea of swinging it out of the bed. If he tipped himself out in the way he could keep his head from injury by, in that way, he could keep his head from injury by lifting it at an acute angle when he fell. His back seemed to be hard and was not likely to suffer from a fall on the carpet. His biggest worry was the loud crash he would not be able to help making, which would probably cause anxiety, if not terror, behind all the doors. Still, he must take the risk. When he was already half out of the bed, the new method was more a game than an effort, for he needed only to hitch himself across by rocking to and fro. It struck him how simple it would be if he could get help. Two strong people, he thought of his father and the servant girl, would be amply sufficient. They would only have to thrust their arms under his convex back, lever him out of the bed, bend it down with their burden, and then be patient enough to let him turn himself right over onto the floor, where it was to be hoped his legs would then find their proper function. Well, ignoring the fact that the doors were all locked, Ought he really to call for help? In spite of his misery, he could not su suppress a smile at the very idea of it. He had got so far that he could barely keep his e equilibrium when he rocked himself strongly, and he would have, and he would have <laughs> to nerve himself very soon for the final decision, since in five minutes' time it would be a quarter past seven when the front doorbell rang. That someone from the office, he said to himself, and grew almost rigid, while his little legs only jigged about all the faster. For a moment, everything stayed quiet. They're not going to open the door, said Gregor to himself, catching at some kind of irrational hope. But then, of course, the servant girl went, as usual, to the door with her heavy tread and opened it. Gregor needed only to hear the first good morning of the visitor to know immediately who it was, the chief clerk himself. What a fate to be condemned to work for a firm where the smallest omission at once gave rise to the greatest suspicion. Were all employees in a body no, nothing but scoundrels? Was there not among them one single loyal devoted man who, had he wasted only an hour or so of the firm's time in a morning, was so tormented by conscience as to be driven out of his mind and actually incapable of leaving his bed? Wouldn't it really have been sufficient to send an apprentice to inquire, if any inquiry were necessary at all, did the chief clerk himself have to come and thus indicate to the entire family, an innocent family, that this suspicious circumstance could be investigated by no one less versed in affairs than himself? And more through the agitation caused by these reflections than through any act of will, Gregor swung himself out of bed with all his strength. There was a loud thump but it was not really a crash. His fall was broken to some extent by the carpet. His back, too, was less stiff than he thought, and so there was merely a dull thud, not so very startling. Only he had not lifted his head carefully enough and had hit it. He turned it and rubbed it on the carpet in pain and irritation. 
That was something falling down in there, said the chief clerk in the next room to the left. Gregor tried to suppose to himself that something like that, like what had happened to him today, might someday happen to the chief clerk. <laughs> One really could not deny that it was possible. But as if in brusque reply to this supposition, the chief clerk took a couple of firm steps in the next door room, and his patent leather boots creaked. From the right-hand room, his sister was whispering to inform him of the situation. Gregor, the chief clerk's here. I know, muttered Gregor to himself, but he didn't dare make his voice loud enough for his sister to hear it. Gregor, said his father now to the left-hand room, the chief clerk has come and wants to know why you didn't catch the early train. We don't know what to say to him. Besides, he wants to talk to you in person. So open the door, please. He will be good enough to excuse the untidiness of your room. Good morning, Mr. Samsa, the chief clerk was calling amiably meanwhile. He's not well, said his mother to the visitor, while his father was still speaking through the door. He's not, he's not well, sir, believe me. What else would make him miss a train? The boy thinks about nothing but his work. It makes me almost cross the way he never goes out in the evenings. He's been here the last eight days and has stayed at home every single evening. He just sits there quietly at the table, reading a newspaper or looking through railway timetables. The only amusement he gets is doing fretwork. For instance, he spends two or three evenings cutting out a little picture frame. You would be surprised to see how pretty it is. It's hanging in his room. You'll see it in a minute when Gregor opens the door. I must say I'm glad you've come, sir. We should never have got him to unlock the door by ourselves. He's so obstinate, and I'm sure he's unwell, though he wouldn't have it be so this morning. I'm just coming, said Gregor slowly and carefully, not moving an inch for fear of losing one word of the conversation. I... Uh, I can't think of any other explanation, madam, said the chief clerk. I hope it's nothing serious. Although, on the other hand, I must say that we men of business, or fortunately or unfortunately, very often simply have to ignore any slight indisposition, since business must be attended to. Well, can the chief clerk come in now? asked Gregor's father impatiently, again knocking on the door. No, said Gregor. In the left-hand room, a painful silence followed this refusal. In the right-hand room, his sister began to sob. <laughs> Why didn't his sister join the others? Hell. Why didn't his sister join the others? She was probably newly out of bed and hadn't even begun to put on her clothes yet. Well, why was she crying? Because he wouldn't get up and let the chief clerk in? Because he was in danger of losing his job? And because the chief would begin dunning his parents again for the old debts? Surely these were things one didn't need to worry about for the present. Gregor was still at home and not in the least thinking of deserting the family. At the moment, true, he was lying on the carpet and no one knew the condition he was in. Uh, and no one who knew the condition he was in could seriously expect him to admit the chief clerk. But for such a small discourtesy, which could plausibly be explained away somehow later on, Gregor could hardly be dismissed on the spot. And it seems to Gregor that it would be much more sensible to leave him in peace for the present than to trouble him with tears and entreaties. Still, of course, their uncertainty bewildered them all and excused their behavior. Mr. Osamsa, the chief clerk called now in louder voice, what's the matter with you? Here you are, barricading yourself in your room, giving only yes and no for answers. Uh, causing your parents a lot of unnecessary trouble and neglecting. I mention this only in passing, neglecting your business duties in an incredible fashion. I am speaking here in the name of your parents and of your chief, and I beg you quite seriously to give you, uh, to give me an immediate and precise explanation. You amaze me. You amaze me. I thought you were a quiet, dependable person, and now, all at once, you seem bent on making a disgraceful exhibition of yourself. The chief did hint to me early this evening a possible explanation for your disappearance, with reference to the cash payments that were entrusted to you recently, but I almost pledged my solemn word of honour that this could not be, sir. 
But now I see how incredibly obstinate you are. I no longer have the slightest desire to take your part at all. And your position in the firm is not so unassailable. I came with the, with the intention of telling you all of this in private. But since you are wasting my time so needlessly, I don't see why your parents should near it too. For some time past, your work has been most unsatisfactory. This is not the season of the year for a business boom, of course, we admit that. But a season of the year for doing no business at all? That does not exist, Mr. Samsa. Must not exist. But, sir, cried Gregor, beside himself in his agitation for getting everything else, I I'm just going to open the door this very minute. A slight illness, an attack of giddiness has kept me from getting up. I'm still lying in bed, but I, I feel all right again. I'm getting out of bed now. Just give me a moment or two longer. I'm not quite so well as I thought, but I'm all right. Really, how a thing like that can suddenly strike one down. Only last night I was quite well. My parents can tell you, or rather, I did have a slight presentiment. I must have showed you some sign of, I must have showed some sign of it. Why didn't I report it at the office? But one always thinks that an indisposition can be got over without staying in the house. Oh, sir, do spare my parents. All that you're reproaching me with now has no foundation. No one has ever said a word to me about it. Perhaps you haven't looked at the last orders I sent in. Anyhow, I can still catch the eight o'clock train. I'm much the better for my few hours rest. Don't let me detain you here, sir. I'll be attending to business very soon. And do be good enough to tell the chief so and to make my excuses to him. And while all this was tumbling out pell-mell, and Gregor hardly knew what he was saying, he had reached this, his, the chest quite easily, perhaps because of the practice he had had in bed, and was now trying to lever himself upright by means of it. He meant actually to open the door, actually to show himself and speak to the chief clerk. He was eager to find out what the others, after all their insistence, would say at the sight of him. If they were horrified, then the responsibility was no longer his, and he could stay quiet. But if they took it calmly, then he had no reason either to be upset and could really get to the station for the eight o'clock train if he hurried. At first he slipped down a few times from the polished surface of the chest, but at length, with a last heave, he stood upright. He paid no more attention to the pains in the lower part of his body, however they smarted. Then he let himself fall against the back of a nearby chair and clung with his little legs to the edges of it. That brought him into control of himself again, and he stopped speaking, for now he could listen to what the chief clerk was saying. Did you understand a word of it? The chief clerk was asking. Surely he can be trying to make fools of us. Oh dear, cried his mother in tears. Perhaps he's terribly ill and we're tormenting him. Greet, greet, she called out then. Yes, mother, called his sister from the other side. They were calling to each other across Gregor's room. You must go this minute for the doctor. Gregor is ill. Go for the doctor, quick. Did you hear how he was speaking? That's no human voice. Uh, that's no human voice, said the chief clerk in a voice notably low, because <laughs> that was no human voice, said the chief clerk in a voice notably low, beside the shrillness of the mother's. Anna, Anna, his father was calling through the hall to the kitchen, clapping his hands. Get her locksmith at once. And while the two girls were already running through the hall with a swish of skirts, how could a sister have gotten dressed so quickly? And were tearing the front door open. There was no sound of its closing again. They had evidently left it open, as one does in houses where some great misfortune has happened. But Gregor was now much calmer. The words he uttered were no longer understandable. Apparently, although they seemed clear enough to him, even clearer than before, perhaps because his ear had grown accustomed to the sound of them, Yet, at any rate, people now believed that something was wrong with him and were ready to help him. The positive certainty with which these first measures had been taken comforted him. He felt himself drawn once more into the human circle and hoped for great and remarkable results from both the doctor and the locksmith, without really distinguishing precisely between them, to make his voice as clear as possible for the decisive conversation that was now imminent. He coughed a little, as quietly as he could, of course, since this noise, too, might not sound like a human cough, for all he was able to judge. In the next room, meanwhile, there was complete silence. Perhaps his parents were sitting at the table with the chief clerk, whispering. Perhaps they were all leaning against the door and listening. 
Slowly, Gregor pushed the chair towards the door, then let go of it, caught hold of the door for support. The soles at the end of his little legs were somewhat sticky, and rested it and rested against it for a moment after his efforts. Then he set himself to turning the key in the lock with his mouth. It seemed unhappily that he hadn't really any teeth. What could he grip the key with? But on the other hand, his jaws were certainly very strong. With their help, he did manage to set the key in motion, heedless of the fact that he was undoubtedly damaging them somewhere, since a brown fluid issued from his mouth, flowed over the key, and dripped on the floor. Just listen to that, said the chief clerk next door. He's turning the key. That was a great encouragement to Gregor, but they should have all shouted encouragement to him. But they should have all but they should all have shouted encouragement to him, his father and mother too. Go on, Gregor, they should have called out. Keep going, hold on to that key. And in the belief that they were all following his efforts intently, he clenched his jaws recklessly on the key with all the force of his command. As the turning of the key progressed, he circled round the lock, holding on now only with his mouth, pushing on the key as required, or pulling it down again with all the weight of his body. The louder click of the finally yielding lock literally quickened Gregor. With a deep breath of relief, he said to himself, so I didn't need the locksmith, and laid his head on the handle to open the door wide. Since he had to pull the door towards him, he was still invisible when it was really wide open. He had to edge himself slowly round the near half of the double door, and to do it very carefully as if he was not to, uh, if he was not to fall plump upon his back just on the threshold. He was still carrying out this difficult maneuver with no time to observe anything else when he heard the chief clerk utter a loud, Arrow! It sounded like a gust of wind. <laughs> <laughs> and now he could see the man standing as he was nearest to the door, clapping one hand before his open mouth and slowly backing away as if driven by some invisible steady pressure. His mother, in spite of the chief clerk's being there, her hair was still undone and sticking up in all directions, first clasped her hands and looked at his father, then took two steps toward Gregor and fell on the floor among her outspread skirts, her face quite hidden on her breast. His father nodded his fist with a fierce expression on his face, as if he meant to knock Gregor back into his room, then looked uncertainly round the living room, covered his eyes with his hands, and wept until his great chest heaved. Gregor did not go now into the living room, but leaned against the inside of the firmly shut wing of the door, so that only half his body was visible and his head above it, bending sideways to look at the others. The light had meanwhile strengthened. On the other side of the street, one could see a clearly see clearly a section of the endlessly long dark gray building opposite it was the hospital it was a hospital abruptly punctuated by its row of regular windows the rain was still falling but only large singly discernible and literally singly splashing drops the breakfast dishes were set out on the table lavishly for breakfast was the most important meal of the day to gregor's father who lingered it out for hours over various newspapers Right opposite Gregor, on the wall, hung a photograph of himself on military service as a lieutenant, hand on sword, a carefree smile on his face, inviting one to respect his uniform and military bearing. The doctor leading to the hall, the door leading to the hall was open, and one could see that the front door stood open too, showing the landing beyond and the beginning of the stairs going down. Well, said Gregor, knowing perfectly well he was the only one who had retained any compo composure. I'll put my clothes on at once, pack up my samples and start off. Will you only let me go? You see, sir, I'm not obstinate and I'm willing to work. Traveling is a hard life, but I couldn't live without it. Where are you going, sir? To the office? Yes. Will you give a true account of all this? One can be temporarily incapacitated, but that's just the moment for remembering former services and bearing in mind that later on, when the incapacity has been got over, one will certainly work with all the more industry and concentration. I'm loyally bound to serve the chief. You know that very well. Besides, I have to provide for my parents and my sister. I'm in great difficulties, but I'll get out of them again. Don't make things any worse for me than they are. Stand up for me in the firm. Travelers are not popular there, I know. People think they earn sacks of money and just have a good time. A prejudice there's no particular reason for revising, but you, sir, have a more comprehensive view of affairs than the rest of the staff. Yes, let me tell you in confidence, a more comprehensive view than the chief himself, who, being the owner, lets his judgment easily be swayed against one of his employees. And you know very well that the traveler 
who is never seen in the office almost the whole year round, can so easily fall a victim to gossip and ill luck and unfounded complaints, which he mostly knows nothing about, except when he comes back exhausted from his rounds, and only then suffers in person from their evil consequences, which he can no longer trace back to the original causes. Sir, sir, don't go away without a word to me, to show that you think me in the, in the right, at least to some extent. But at Gregor's very first words, the chief clerk had already backed away and only stared at him with parted lips over one twitching shoulder. And while Gregor was speaking, he did not stand still one moment, but stole away towards the door without taking his eyes off Gregor, yet only an inch at a time, as if obeying some secret injunction to leave the room. He was already at the hall, already at the hall, and the suddenness with which he took his last step out of the living room would have made one believe he had burned the sole of his foot. Once in the hall, he stretched his right arm before him towards the staircase as if some new supernatural power were waiting there to deliver him. Gregor perceived that the chief clerk must be no account, must on no account be allowed to go away in this frame of mind if his position in the firm were not to be endangered to the utmost. His parents did not understand this so well. They had convinced themselves in the course of years that Gregor was settled for life in this firm. And besides, they were so preoccupied with their immediate troubles that all foresight had forsaken them. Yet Gregor had this foresight. The chief clerk must be detained, soothed, persuaded, and finally won over. The whole future of Gregor and his family depended on it. If only his sister had been there. She was intelligent. She had begun to cry while Gregor was still lying quietly on his back, and no doubt the chief clerk, so partial to ladies, would have been guided by her. She would have shut the door of the flat and, in the hall, talked him out of his horror. But she was not there, and Gregor would have to handle the situation himself, and without remembering that he was still unaware what powers of movement he possessed, without even remembering that his words in all possibility, indeed in all likelihood, would again be unintelligible, he let go the wing at the door, pushed himself through the opening, started to walk towards the chief clerk, who was already ridiculously clinging with both hands to the railing on the landing, but immediately, as he was feeling for support, he fell down with a little cry upon all his numerous legs. Hardly was he down when he ex experienced for the first time this morning a sense of physical comfort. His legs had firm ground under them. They were completely obedient, as he noted with joy. They even strove to carry him forward in whatever direction he chose, and he was inclined to believe that a final relief from all his sufferings was at hand. But in the same moment, he, as he found himself on the floor, rocking with a suppressed eagerness to move not far from his mother, indeed, just in front of her, she, who had seemed so completely crushed, sprang all at once to her feet. Her arms and fingers outspread, cried, help, for God's sake, help, bent her head down as if to see Gregor better yet, yet on the contrary, kept backing senselessly away, had quite forgotten that the laden table stood behind her, sat upon it hastily, as if in absence of mind, when she bumped into it, and seemed altogether unaware that the big coffee pot beside her was upset and pouring coffee in a flood over the carpet. Mother, mother, said Gregor in a low voice, and <laughs> mother, mother, said Gregor in a low voice, and looked up at her. The chief clerk, for the moment, had quite slipped from his mind. Instead, he could not resist snapping his jaws together at the sight of the streaming coffee. That made his mother scream again. She fled from the table and fell into the arms of his father, who hastened to catch her. But Gregor had now no time to spare for his parents. The chief clerk was already on the stairs. With his chin on the banister, he was taking one last backward look. Gregor made a spring to be as sure as possible of overtaking him. The chief clerk must have divined his intention, for he leaped down several steps and vanished. He was still yelling, Ugh! and it echoed through the whole staircase. Unfortunately, the flight of the chief clerk seemed completely to upset Gregor's father, who had remained relatively calm until now, for instead of running after the man himself, or at least not hindering Gregor in his pursuit, he seized in his right hand the walking stick which the chief clerk had left behind on a chair, together with a hat and a great coat. Uh, snatched in his left hand and a large newspaper from the table and began stamping his feet and flourishing the stick and the newspaper to drive Gregor back into his room. No entreaty of Gregor's availed. Indeed, no entreaty was even understood. However humbly he bent his head, his father only stamped on the floor the more loudly. Behind his father, his mother had torn open a window despite the cold weather and was leaning far out of it with her face in her hands. A strong draft set in front, set in from the street, to the staircase. 
the window curtains blew in, the newspapers on the table fluttered, stray pages whisked over the floor. Pitilessly, Gregor's father drove him back, hissing and crying, shoo, like a savage. But Gregor was quite unpracticed in walking backwards. It really was a slow business. If he had only a chance to turn around, he could get back to his room at once, but he, he was afraid of exasperating his father by the slowness of such a rotation, and at any moment the stick in his father's hand might hit him a fatal blow on the back or on the head. In the end, however, nothing else was left for him to do since his horror he observed that since to his horror, he observed that in moving backwards, he could not even control the direction he took, and so, keeping an anxious eye on his father all the time over his shoulder, he began to turn round as quickly as he could, which was in reality very slowly. Perhaps his father noted his good intentions, for he did not interfere except every now and then to help him in the maneuver from a distance with the point of the stick. If only he would have stopped making that unbearable hissing noise. It made Gregor quite lose his head. He had turned almost completely round when the hissing noise so distracted him that he even turned a little the wrong way again. But when at last his head was fortunately right in front of the doorway, it appeared that his body was too broad to simply go through the opening. His father, of course, in present mood, was far from thinking of such a thing as opening the other half of the door to let Gregor have enough space. He had merely, he had merely the fixed idea of driving Gregor back into his room as quickly as possible. He would never have suffered Gregor to make the cir circumstantial preparations for standing up on end and perhaps slipping his way through the door. Maybe he was now making more noise than ever to urge Gregor forward, as if no obstacle impeded him. To Gregor, anyhow, the noise in his rear sounded no longer like the voice of one single father. This was really no joke, and Gregor thrust himself, come what might, come what might, into the doorway. One side of his body rose up, he was tilted at an angle in, in the doorway. His flank was quite bruised. Horrid blotches stained the white door. Soon he was stuck fast and left to himself, could not have moved at all. His legs on one side fluttered trembling in the air. Those on the other were crushed painfully to the floor. When, behind, when from behind, his father gave him a strong push, which was a literal deliverance, and he flew far into the room, bleeding freely. The door was slammed behind them with the stick. And then at last, there was silence. Woo! Exhausting. That was part one of Metamorphosis, Franz Kafka. One of those short stories that gets selected and placed in, in a collection. A collection of selected short stories by Franz Kafka. Here's Roman numeral two of that, barreling onward. Not until it was twilight did Gregor awake out of a deep sleep, more like a swoon than a sleep. He would certainly have waked up of waked up of his own accord not much later, for he felt himself sufficiently rested and well slept, but it seemed to him as if a fleeting step and a cautious shutting of the door leading into the hall had aroused him. The electric lights in the street cast a pale sheen here and there on the ceiling and the upper surfaces of the furniture, but down below, where he lay, it was dark slowly, awkwardly trying out his feelers, which he now first learned to appreciate, he pushed his way to the door to see what had been happening there. His left side felt like one single long, unpleasantly tense scar, and he had actually and he had actually to limp on his two rows of legs. One little leg, moreover, had been severely damaged in the course of that morning's events. It was almost a miracle that only one had been damaged and trailed uselessly behind him. He had reached the door before he discovered what had really drawn him to it, the smell of food, for there stood a basin filled with fresh milk in which floated little sops of white bread. He could almost have laughed with joy since he was now still hungrier than in the morning, and he dipped his head almost over the eye straight into the milk, but soon in disappointment he withdrew it again. Not only did he find it difficult to feed because of his tender left side, and he couldn't only feed with the palpitating collaboration of his whole body, and he could only feed with the palpitating collaboration of his, old, of his whole body. He did not like the milk either. Although milk had been his favorite drink, and that was certainly why his sister had it set there for him, indeed it was almost with repulsion that he turned away from the basin and crawled back to the middle of the room. He could see through the crack of the door that the gas was turned on in the living room, but while usually at this time his father made a habit of reading the afternoon newspaper in a loud voice to his mother and occasionally to his sister as well, 
not a sound was now to be heard. Well, perhaps his father had recently given up this habit of reading aloud, which his sister had mentioned so often in conversation and in her letters. But there was the same silence all around, although the flat was certainly not empty of occupants. What a quiet life our family has been leading, said Gregor to himself. And as he sat there motionless, staring into the darkness, he felt great pride in the fact that he had been able to provide such a life for his parents and sister in such a fine flat. But what if all the quiet, the comfort, the contentment, were now to end in horror? To keep himself from being lost in such thoughts, Gregor took refuge in movement and crawled up and down the room. Once during the long evening, one of the side doors was opened a little and quickly shut again, later the other side door too, Someone had apparently wanted to come in, and then thought better of it. Gregor now stationed himself immediately before the living room door, determined to persuade any hesitating visitor to come in, or at least to discover who it might be. But the door was not opened again, and he waited in vain. In the early morning, when the doors were locked, they had all wanted to come in. Now that he had opened one door, and the other had apparently been opened during the day, no one came in, and even the keys were on the other side of the doors. It was late at night before the gas went out in the living room, and Gregor could easily tell that his parents and his sister had all stayed awake until then, for he could clearly hear the three of them stealing away on tiptoe. No one was likely to visit him, not until the morning, that was certain, so he had plenty of time to meditate at his leisure on how he was to arrange his life afresh, but the lofty, empty room in which he had to lie flat on the floor filled him with an apprehension he could not account for since it had been his very own room for the past five years, and with a half-conscious and with a half-unconscious action, not without a slight feeling of shame, he scuttled under the sofa, where he felt comfortable at once, although his back was a little cramped, and he could not lift his head up, and his only regret was that his body was too broad to get the whole of it under the sofa. He stayed there all night, spending the time partly in a light slumber, from which his hunger kept waking him up with a start, and partly in worrying and sketching vague hopes which all led to the same conclusion, that he must lie low for the present, and by exercising patience and the utmost consideration, help the family to bear the inconvenience he was bound to cause them in his present condition. Very early in the morning, it was still almost night, Gregor had the chance to test the strength of his new resolutions, for his sister, nearly fully dressed, opened the door from the hall and peered in. She did not see him at once, Yet when she caught sight of him under the sofa, well, he had to be somewhere. He couldn't have flown away, could he? She was so startled that without being able to help it, she slammed the door shut again. But as if regretting her behavior, she opened the door again immediately and came in on tiptoe, as if she were visiting an invalid or even a stranger. Gregor had pushed his head forward to the very edge of the sofa and watched her. Would she notice that he had left the milk standing, and not for lack of hunger, and would she bring in some other kind of food more to his taste? If she did not do it of her own accord, he would rather starve than draw her attention to the fact that, although he felt a wild impulse to dart out from under the sofa, throw himself at her feet and beg her for something to eat, but his sister at once noticed, with surprise, that the basin was still full, except for a little milk that had been spilt all around it. She lifted it immediately, not with her bare hands, true, but with a cloth, and carried it away. Gregor was wildly curious to know what she would bring instead, and made various speculations about it, yet what she actually did next, in the goodness of her heart, he could never have guessed at. To find out what he liked, she brought him a whole selection of food, all set out on an old newspaper. There were old half-decayed vegetables, bones from last night's supper covered with a white sauce that had thickened, some raisins and almonds, a piece of cheese that Gregor would have called uneatable two days ago, a dry roll of bread, a buttered roll, and a roll both buttered and salted. Besides all that, she set down again the same basin, into which she had poured some water, and which was apparently to be reserved for his exclusive use. And with fine tact, knowing that Gregor would not eat in her presence, she withdrew quickly and even turned the key to let him understand that he could take his ease as much as he liked. Gregor's legs all whizzed toward the food, his wounds must have healed completely, moreover, for he felt no more than a month ago he had cut one finger a little with a knife and had still suffered pain from the wound only the day before yesterday. Am I less sensitive now, he thought, and sucked greedily at the cheese, which above all the other edibles attracted him at once and strongly. One after another, and with tears of satisfaction in his eyes, he quickly devoured the cheese, the vegetables, and the sauce. 
The fresh food, on the other hand, had no charms for him. He could not even stand the smell of it and actually dragged away to some little distance the things he could eat. He had long finished his meal and was only lying lazily on the same spot when his sister turned the key slowly as a sign for him to retreat. That roused him at once, although he was nearly asleep and he hurried under the sofa again. But it took considerable self-control for him to stay under the sofa, even for the short time his sister was in the room, since the large meal had swollen his body somewhat, and he was so cramped he could hardly breathe. Slight attacks of breathlessness afflicted him, and his eyes were starting a little out of his head as he watched his unsuspecting sister sweeping together with a broom not only the remains of what he had eaten, but even the things he had not touched, as if these were now of no use to anyone, and hastily shoveling it all into a bucket which she covered with a wooden lid and carried away. Hardly had she turned her back when Gregor came from under the sofa and stretched and puffed himself out. In this manner, Gregor was fled. Uh, in this manner, Gregor was fed. Once in the early morning, while his parents and the servant girl were still asleep, and a second time after they had all had their midday dinner. For then his parents took a short nap, and the servant girl could be sent out on some errand or other by his sister. Not that they would have wanted him to starve, of course, but perhaps they could not have borne to know more about his feeding than from hearsay. Perhaps, too, his sister wanted to spare them such little anxieties wherever possible, since they had quite enough to bear as it was. Under what pretext the doctor and the locksmith had been got rid of on that first morning, Gregor could not discover, for since what he said was not understood by the others, it never struck any of them, not even his sister, that he could understand what they said, and so whenever his sister came into his room he had no content himself with hearing her other only oh so and so whenever his sister came into his room he had to content himself with hearing her utter only a sigh now and then a sigh now and then and an occasional appeal to the saints later on when she had got little used to a little used to the situation of course she could never get completely used to it she sometimes threw out a remark which was kindly meant or could be so interpreted well he liked his dinner today she would say when Gregor had made a good clearance of his food, and when he had not eaten, which gradually happened more and more often, she would say almost sadly, everything's been left standing again. But although Gregor could get no news directly, he overheard a lot from the neighboring rooms, and as soon as voices were audible, he would run to the door of the room concerned and press his whole body against it. In the first few days especially, there was no conversation that did not refer to him somehow, even if in indirectly. For two whole days, there were family consultations at every mealtime about what should be done. But also between meals, the same subject was discussed, for there were always at least two members of the family at home, since no one wanted to be alone in the flat, and to leave it quite empty was unthinkable. And on the very first of these days, the household cook, it was not quite clear what and how much she knew of the situation, went down on her knees to his mother and begged leave to go. And when she departed, a quarter of an hour later, gave thanks for her dismissal with tears in her eyes, as if for the greatest benefit that could have been conferred on her, and without any prompting, swore a solemn oath that she would never say a single word to anyone about what had happened. Now Gregor's sister had to cook too, helping her mother. True, the cooking did not amount to much, for they ate scarcely anything. Gregor was always hearing one of the family vainly urging another to eat and getting no answer, but thanks I've had all I want, or something similar. Perhaps they drank nothing either. Time and, time and again, his sister kept asking his father if he wouldn't like some beer and offered kindly to go and fetch it herself. And when he made no answer, suggested that she could ask the concierge to fetch it so that he uh, need feel no sense of obligation. But then a round of no came from his father and no more was said about it. In the course of that very first day, Gregor's father explained the family's financial position and prospects to both his mother and his sister. Now and then he rose from the table to get some voucher or memorandum out of the small safe he had rescued from the collapse of his business five years earlier. One could hear him opening the complicated lock and rustling papers out and shutting it again. Shutting it again. This statement made by his father was the first cheerful information Gregor had heard since his imprisonment. He had been out of the opinion... He had been of the opinion that nothing at all was left over from his father's business. At least his father had never said anything to the contrary, and of course he had not asked him directly. 
At that time, Gregor's sole desire was to do his utmost to help the family to forget as soon as possible the catastrophe which had overwhelmed the business and thrown them all into a state of complete despair. And so he had set to work with unusual ardor, and almost overnight had become a commercial traveler instead of a little clerk. And of course, much greater chances of earning money. And his success was immediately translated into good round coin, which he could lay on the table for his amazed and happy family. These had been fine times, and they had never recurred, at least not with the same sense of glory. Although later on, Gregor had earned so much money that he was able to meet the expenses of the whole household and did so. They had simply got used to it, both the family and Gregor. The money was gratefully accepted and gladly given, but there was no special uprush of warm feeling. With his sister alone, he had... Uh, with his sister alone had he remained intimate, and it was a secret plan of his that she, who loved music unlike himself, and could play movingly on the violin, should be sent next year to study at the conservatorium, despite the great expense that would entail, which must be made up in some other way. During his brief visits home, the conservatorium was often mentioned in the talks he had with his sister, but always merely as a beautiful dream, which could never come true, and his parents discouraged even these innocent references to it. Yet Gregor had made up his mind firmly about it, and meant to announce the fact with due solemnity on Christmas Day. Such were the thoughts, completely futile in his present condition, that went through his head as he stood changing, clinging upright to the door and listening. Sometimes, out of sheer weariness, he had to give up listening and let his head fall negligently against the door. But he always had to pull himself together again at once, for even the slight sound his head made was audible next door and brought all conversation to a stop. What can he be doing now? His father would say after a while, obviously turning towards the door, and only then would be interrupted, would the interrupted conversation gradually be set going again. Gregor was now informed as amply as he could wish, for his father tended to repeat himself in his explanations, partly because it was a long time since he had handled such matters, and partly because his mother could not always grasp things at once, that a certain amount of investment, a very small amount, it was true, had survived the wreck of their fortunes, and had even increased a little because the dividends had not been touched meanwhile. And besides that, the money Gregor brought home every month, he had kept only a few dollars for himself, had never been quite used up, and now amounted to a small capital sum. Behind the door, Gregor nodded his head eagerly, rejoiced at this evidence of unexpected thrift and of unexpected thrift and foresight. True, he could really have paid off he could really have paid off some more of his father's debts to the chief with this extra money, and so brought much nearer the day on which he could quit his job, but doubtless it was better the way his father had arranged it. Yet this capital was by no means sufficient to let the family live on the interest of it. For one year, perhaps, or at the most two, they could live on the principal. That was all. It was simply a sum that ought not to be touched, and should be kept for a rainy day. Money for living expenses would have to be earned. Now his father was still hale enough, but an old man, and he had done no work for the past five years, and could not be expected to do much. During these five years, the first years of leisure in his laborious, though unsuccessful life, he had grown rather fat and become sluggish, and Gregor's old mother, how was she to earn a living with her asthma, which troubled her even when she walked through the flat and kept her lying on a sofa every other day, panting for breath beside an open window? And was his sister to earn her bread, she who was still a child of seventeen, and whose life hitherto had been so pleasant, consisting as it did in dressing herself nicely, sleeping long, helping in the housekeeping, going out to a few modest entertainments, and above all playing the violin, at first, whenever the need for earning money was mentioned, Gregor let go his hold on the door and threw himself down on the cool leather sofa beside it. He felt so hot with shame and grief. Often he just lay there, the long night through, without sleeping at all, scrabbling for hours on the leather. Or he nerved himself to the great effort of pushing an armchair to the window, then crawled up over the window sill and braced against the chair, leaned against the window panes, obviously, and some recollection of the sense of freedom that looking out of a window always used to give him, for in reality, day by day, things that were even a little way off were growing dimmer to his sight. The hospital across the street, which he used to execrate for being 
all too often before his eyes, was now quite beyond his range of vision. And if he had not known that he lived in Charlotte Street, a quiet street, but still a city street, he might have believed that his window gave on a desert waste where gray sky and gray land blended un indistinguishably into each other. His quick-witted sister only needed to observe twice that the armchair stood by the window. After that, whenever she had tidied the room, she always pushed the chair back to the same place at the window and even left the inner casements open. If he could have spoken to her and thanked her for all she had to do for him, he could have borne her ministrations better, as it was they oppressed him. She certainly tried to make as light as possible of whatever was disagreeable in her task, and as time went on she succeeded, of course, more and more, but time brought more enlightenment to Gregor, too. The very way she came in distressed him. Hardly was she in the room when she rushed to the window, without even taking time to shut the door, careful as she was usually to shield the sight of Gregor's room from the others, and as if she were almost suffocating, tore the casements open with hasty fingers, standing then in the open draft for a while, even in the bitterish cold, and drawing deep breaths. This noisy scurry of hers upset Gregor twice a day. He would crouch trembling under the sofa all the time, knowing quite well that she would certainly have spared him such a disturbance had she found it at all possible to stay in his presence without opening the window. On one occasion, about a month after Gregor's metamorphosis, when there was surely no reason for her to be still startled at his appearance, she came in a little earlier than usual and found him gazing out of the window, quite motionless, and thus well placed to look like a bogey. Gregor would not have been surprised had she not come in at all, for she could not immediately open the window while he was there, but not only did she retreat, but not only did she retreat, she jumped back as if in alarm and banged the door shut. A stranger might well have thought that he had been lying in wait for her, there meaning to bite her. Of course, he hid himself under the sofa at once, but he had to wait until midday before she came again, and she seemed more ill at ease than usual. This made him realize how repulsive the sight of him still was to her, and that it was bound to go on being repulsive, and what an effort it must cost her not to run away even from the sight of the small portion of his body that stuck out from under the sofa. In order to spare her that, therefore, one day he carried a sheet on his back to the sofa. It cost him four hours' labor and arranged it there in such a way as to hide him completely, so that even if she were to bend down, she could not see him. Had she considered the sheet unnecessary, she would certainly have stripped it off the sofa again, for it was clear enough that this curtaining and confining of himself was not likely to conduce to Gregor's comfort, but she left it where it was, and Gregor even fancied that he caught a thankful glance from her eye when he lifted the sheet carefully a very little with his head to see how she was taking the new arrangement. For the first fortnight, his parents could not bring themselves to the point of entering his room, and he often heard them expressing their appreci appreciation of his sister's activities, whereas formerly they had frequently scolded her for being, as they thought, a somewhat useless daughter. But now both of them often waited outside the door, his father and his mother, while his sister tidied his room, and as soon as she came out, she had to tell them exactly how things were in the room, what Gregor had eaten, how he had conducted himself this time, and whether there was not perhaps some slight improvement in his condition. His mother, moreover, began relatively soon to want to visit him, but his father and sister dissuaded her at first with arguments which Gregor listened to very attentively and altogether approved. Later, however, she had to be held back by main, by main force, and when she cried out, Do let me in to Gregor. He is my unfortunate son. Can't you understand that I must go to him? Gregor thought that it might be well to have her come in, not every day, of course, but perhaps once a week. She understood things, after all, much better than his sister, who was only a child despite the effort she was making, and had per perhaps taken on so difficult a task, really out of childish, childish thoughtlessness. Gregor's desire to see his mother was soon fulfilled. During the daytime, he did not want to show himself at the window, out of consideration for his parents, but he could not crawl very far around the few square yards of floor space he had, nor could he bear lying quietly at rest all day during the night, all during the night, while he was fast losing any interest he had ever taken in food, so that was, so that for more, mm, okay. During the daytime, he did not want to show himself at the window out of consideration for his parents, but he could not crawl very far around the few square yards of floor space he had, nor could he bear lying quietly at rest all during the night while he was fast losing any interest he had ever taken in food, so that for mere recreation, he had formed the habit of crawling crisscross over the walls and ceiling. 
He especially enjoyed hanging suspended from the ceiling. It was much better than lying on the floor. One could breathe more freely. One's body swung and it rocked lightly. And in the almost blissful absorption induced by the suspension, it could happen to his own surprise that he let go and fell plump on the floor. Yet now he had his body much better under control than formerly, and even such a big fall did him no harm. His sister at once remarked that the new distraction Gregor had found for himself, he left traces behind him of the sticky stuff on his soles wherever he crawled, and she got the idea in her head of giving him as wide a field as possible to crawl in and of remaining the pieces of furniture that hindered him. Crawl in and of removing the pieces of furniture that hindered him, above all the chest of drawers and the writing desk. But that was more than she could manage all by herself. She did not dare ask her father to help her. And as for the servant girl, a young creature of sixteen, who had the courage to stay on after the cook's departure, she could not be asked to help, for she had begged as an especial favor that she might keep the kitchen door locked and opened, open it only on definite summons, so that there was nothing left but to apply to her mother at an hour when her father was out. And the old lady did come with exclamations of joyful eagerness, which, however, died away at the door of Gregor's room. Gregor's sister, of course, went in first to see that everything was in order before letting his mother enter. In great haste, Gregor pulled the sheet lower and rucked it more in folds, so that it really looked as if it had been thrown accidentally over the sofa. And this time he did not peer out from under it. He renounced the pleasure of seeing his mother on this occasion, and was only glad that she had come at all. Come in. He's out of sight, said his sister, obviously leading her mother in by the hand. Gregor could now hear the two women struggling to shift the heavy old chest from its place, and his sister claiming the greater part of the labor for herself without listening to the admonitions of her mother, who feared she might overstrain herself. It took a long time. After at least a quarter of an hour's tugging, his mother objected that the chest had better be left where it was, for in the first place it was too heavy and could never be got out before his father came home. Standing in the middle of the room like that, it would only hamper Gregor's movements, while in the second place it was not at all certain that removing the furniture would be doing a service to Gregor. She was inclined to think to the contrary. The sight of the naked walls made her own heart heavy, and why shouldn't Gregor had the same feeling, considering that he had been used to this furniture for so long and might feel forlorn without it. And it doesn't look, she concluded in a low voice. And it doesn't look, she concluded in a low voice. In fact, she had been almost whispering all the time, as if to avoid letting Gregor, whose exact whereabouts she did not know, hear even the tones of her voice, for she was convinced that he could not understand her words. Doesn't it look as if we're showing him, by taking away his furniture, that we have given up hope of his ever getting better, and are just leaving him coldly to himself? I think it would be best to keep his room exactly as it has always been, so that when he comes back to us, he will find everything unchanged, and be able all the more easily to forget what has happened in between. On hearing these words from his mother, Gregor realized that the lack of all direct human speech for the past two months together with the monotony of family life must have confused his mind, otherwise he could not account for the fact that he had quite earnestly looked forward to having his room emptied of furnishing. Did he really want his warm room, so comfortably fitted with old family furniture, to be turned into a naked den in which he would certainly be able to crawl unhampered in all directions, but at the price of shedding his simultaneously all recollection of his human background? He had indeed been so near the brink of forgetfulness that only the voice of his mother, which he had not heard for so long, had drawn him back from it. Nothing should be taken out of his room. Everything must stay as it was. It could, he could not dispense with the good influence of the furniture on his state of mind, and even if the furniture did hamper him in his senseless crawling round and round, that was no drawback but a great advantage. Unfortunately, his sister was of the contrary opinion. She had grown accustomed, and not without reason, to consider herself an expert in Gregor's affairs but, uh, against her parents, as against her parents, and so her mother's advice was now enough to make her determined on the removal not only of the chest and the writing desk, which had been her first intention, but of all furniture except the indispensable sofa. This determination was not, of course, merely the outcome of childish recalcitrance and of self-confidence she had recently developed so unexpectedly and at such cost she had in fact perceived that gregor needed a lot of space to crawl around in about him while on the other hand he had never used the furniture at all so far as could be seen another factor might have been also the enthusiastic temperament of an adolescent girl which seeks to indulge itself on every opportunity in which now tempted greet to 
exaggerate the horror of her brother's circumstances in order that she might do all the more for him. In a room where Gregor lorded it all alone over empty walls, no one save herself was likely ever to set foot. In a room where Gregor lorded it all alone over empty walls, no one save herself was likely ever to set foot. And so she was not to be moved from her resolve by her mother, who seemed moreover to be ill at ease in Gregor's room and therefore unsure of herself, was soon reduced to silence and helped her daughter as best she could to push the chest outside. Now Gregor could do without the chest if need be, but the writing desk he must retain. As soon as the two women had got the chest out of his room, groaning as they pushed it, Gregor stuck his head out from under the sofa to see how he might intervene as kindly and cautiously as possible. But as bad luck would have it, his mother was the first to return, leaving Greek clasping the chest in the room next door, where she was trying to shift it all by herself without, of course, moving it from the spot. His mother, however, was not accustomed to the sight of him. It might sicken her, and so in alarm, Gregor backed quickly to the other end of the sofa, yet could not prevent the sheet from swaying a little in front. That was enough to put her on the alert. She paused, stood for a moment, and then went back to Greek. Although Gregor kept reassuring himself that nothing out of the way was happening, only a few bits of furniture were being changed around, he soon had to admit that all this trotting to and fro of the two women, their little ejaculations, and the scraping of furniture along the floor affected him like a vast disturbance coming from all sides at once, and however much he tucked in his head and legs and cowered to the very floor, he was bound to confess that he would not be able to stand it for long. They were clearing his room out, taking away everything he loved. The chest in which he kept his fret saw and other tools was already dragged off. They were now loosening the writing desk, which had almost sunk into the floor, the desk at which he had done all his homework when he was at the commercial academy, at the grammar school before that, and yes, even at the primary school, he had had no more time to waste in weighing the good intentions of the two women whose existence he had by now almost forgotten, for they were so exhausted that they were laboring in silence and nothing could be heard but the heavy scuffling of their feet. And so he rushed out. The women were just leaning against the writing desk in the next room to give themselves a breather, and four times changed his direction, since he really did not know where to, what to rescue first. Then on the wall opposite, which was already otherwise cleared, he was struck by the picture of the lady muffled in so much fur, and quickly crawled up to it and pressed himself to the glass, which was a good surface to hold on to, and comforted his hot belly. This picture, at least, which was entirely hidden beneath him, was going to be removed by nobody. He turned his head towards the door of the living room so as to observe the women when they came back. They had not allowed themselves much of a rest and were already coming. Greet had twined her, twined her arm round her mother and was almost supporting her. Well, what shall we take now? said Greet, looking round. Her eyes met Gregor's from the wall. She kept her composure, presumably because of her mother, bent her head down to her mother to keep her from looking up, and said, although in a fluttering, unpremeditated voice, Come, hadn't we better go back to the living room for a moment? Her intentions were clear enough to Gregor. She wanted to bestow her mother in safety and then chase him from chase him down from the wall. Well, just let her try it. He clung to his picture and would not give it up. He would rather fly in Greet's face. But Greet's words had succeeded in disquieting her mother, who took a step to one side, caught sight of the huge brown mass on the flowered wallpaper, and before she was really conscious that what she saw was Gregor, screamed in a loud, hoarse voice, Oh God! Oh God! Fell with outspread arms over the sofa as if giving up and did not move. Gregor, cried his sister, shaking her fist and glaring at him. This was the first time she had directly addressed him since his metamorphosis. She ran into the next room for some aromatic essence with which to rouse her mother from her fainting fit. Gregor wanted to help too. There was still time to rescue the picture, but he was stuck fast to the glass and had to tear himself loose. He then ran after his sister into the next room as if he could advise her, as he used to do, but then he had to stand helplessly behind her. She, meanwhile, searched among various small bottles, and when she turned round, started in alarm at the sight of him. One bottle fell on the floor and broke. A splinter of glass cut Gregor's face, and some kind of corrosive medicine splashed him. Without pausing a moment longer, Greet Gre gathered up all the bottles she could carry and ran to her mother with them. She banged the door shut with her foot. Gregor was now cut off from his mother, who was perhaps nearly dying because of him. He dared not open the door for fear of frightening away his sister, who had, who had to stay with her mother. There was nothing he could do but wait and harassed by self-reproach and worry. He began now to crawl to and fro over everything, walls, furniture, and ceiling. And finally, in his despair, when the whole room seemed to be reeling round him, fell down on the middle of the big table. Fell down onto the middle of the big table. A little while elapsed. Gregor was still lying there feebly, and all around was quiet. Perhaps that was a good omen. 
Then the doorbell rang. The servant girl was, of course, locked in her kitchen, and Greet would have to open the door. It was his father. What had been happening were his first words. Greet's face must have told him everything. Greet answered in a muffled voice, apparently hiding her head on his breast. Mother has been fainting, but she's better now. Gregor's broken loose. Just what I expected, said his father. Just what I've been telling you, but you women would never listen. It was clear to Gregor that his father had taken the worst interpretation of Greet's all-too-brief statement and was assuming that Gregor had been guilty of some violent act. Therefore, Gregor must now try to propitate, propitate his father, since he had neither time nor means for an explanation. And so he fled to the door of his own room and crouched against it to let his father see as soon as he came in from the hall that his son had the good intention of getting back into his room immediately, and that was, and that it was not necessarily to drive him there, but that if only the door were opened, he would disappear at once. Yet his father was not in the mood to perceive such fine distinctions. Ah! he cried as soon as he appeared, in a tone which sounded at once angry and exultant. Gregor drew his head back from the door and lifted it to look at his father. Truly, this was not the father he had imagined to himself. Admittedly, he had been too absorbed of late in his new recreation of crawling over the ceiling to take the same interest as before in what was happening elsewhere in the flat, and he ought really to be prepared for some changes. And yet, and yet, could that be his father? The man who used to lie warily sunk in bed whenever Gregor set out on a business journey? Who welcomed him back of an evening lying in a long chair in a dressing gown? Who could not really rise to his feet but only lifted his arms in greeting? And on the rare occasions when he did go out with his family, on one or two Sundays a year, and on high holidays, walked between Gregor and his mother, who were slow walkers anyhow, even more slowly than they did, muffled in his own gray coat, muffled in his old great coat, shuffling laboriously forward with the help of his crook-handled stick, which he set down most cautiously at every step, and, whenever he wanted to say anything, nearly always came to a full stop and gathered his escort around him. Now he was standing there in fine shape, dressed in a smart blue uniform with gold buttons, such as bank messengers wear. His strong double chin bulged over the stiff high collar of his jacket. From under his bushy eyebrows, his black eyes darted fresh and penetrated glancings, glances. His one-time uh, tangled white hair had been combed flat on either side of a shining and carefully exact parting. He pitched his cap, which bore a gold monogram, probably the badge of some bank, in a wide sweep across the whole room on, onto a sofa, and with the tail ends of his jacket thrown back, his hands in his trouser pockets, advanced with a grim visage towards Gregor. Likely enough, he did not himself know what he meant to do. At any rate, he lifted his feet uncommonly high, and Gregor was dumbfounded at the enormous size of his shoe soles. But Gregor could not risk standing up to him, aware as he had been from the very first day of his new life that his father believed only the severest measure suitable for dealing with him. And so he ran before his father, stopping when he stopped stopping when he stopped and scuttling forward again when his father made any kind of move. In this way, they circled the room several times without anything decisive happening. Indeed, the whole operation did not even look like a pursuit because it was carried out so slowly. And so Gregor did not leave the floor, for he feared that his father might take as a piece of peculiar wickedness any excursion of his over the walls or ceiling. All the same, he could not stay this course much longer, for while his father took one step, he had to carry out a whole series of movements. He was already beginning to feel breathless, just as in his former life his lungs had not been very dependable. As he was staggering along, trying to concentrate his energy on running, hardly keeping his eyes open, in his dazed state never even thinking of any other escape than simply going forward, and having almost forgotten that the walls were free to him, which in this room were well provided with finely carved pieces of furniture full of knobs and crevices, suddenly something lightly flung, landed close behind him, and rolled before him. It was an apple. A second apple followed immediately. Gregor came to a stop in alarm. There was no point in running on, for his father was determined to bombard him. He had filled his pockets with fruit from the dish on the sideboard, and was now shying apple after apple, without taking particularly good aim for the, mo for the moment. The small red apples rolled about the floor, as if magnetized and cannoned into each other. An apple thrown without much force grazed Gregor's back and glanced off harmlessly, but another following immediately landed right on his back and sank in. Gregor wanted to drag himself forward, as if this start startling, incredible pain could be left behind him, but he felt as if nailed to the spot and flattened himself out in complete derangement of all his senses. With his last conscious look, he saw the door of his room being torn open and his mother rushing out ahead of his screaming sister. In her underbodice, 
for her daughter had loosened her clothing to let her breathe more freely and recover from her swoon. He saw his mother rushing towards his father, leaving one after another behind her on the floor, her loosened petticoats, stumbling over her petticoats straight to his father and embracing him in complete union with him. But here Gregor's sight began to fail, with her hands clasped round his father's neck as she begged for her son's life. My goodness. That's part two of Metamorphosis. We're going to be careening into part three, um, and that'll continue for some time. Where are we at? An hour and 44 minutes. Pretty cool. Started with the judgment. Now we're reading Metamorphosis. This is, after all, the selected stories of Franz Kafka, read in overexposed color by Robert Price. Three, <clears throat> in Roman numeral. The serious injury done to Gregor, which disabled him for more than a month. The apple went on sticking in his body as a visible reminder, since no one ventured to remove it, seemed to have been made even, seemed to have made even his father recollect that Gregor was a member of the family, despite his present unfortunate and repulsive shape, and ought not to be treated as an enemy, that on the contrary, family duty required the suppression of disgust, and the exercise of patience, nothing but patience. And although his injury had impaired, probably forever, his powers of movement, and for the time being, it took him long, long minutes to creep across his room like an old invalid, there was no question now of crawling up the wall, yet in his own opinion he was sufficiently compensated for this worsening of his condition by the fact that towards the evening the living room door, which used to watch, which he used to watch intently for an hour or two beforehand, was always thrown open, so that lying in the darkness of his room, invisible to the family, he could see them all at the lamplit table and listen to their talk, by general consent, as it were, very different from this earlier eavesdropping. True, their intercourse lacked the lively character of former times, which he had always called to mind with a certain wistfulness in the small hotel bedrooms where he had been wont to throw himself down, tired out, on damp bedding. They were now mostly... They were now mostly very silent. Soon after supper, his father would fall asleep in his armchair. His mother and sister would admonish each other to be silent. His mother, bending low over the lamp, stitched at fine sewing for an underwear firm. His sister, who had taken a job as a sales girl, was, leaning, was learning shorthand and French in the evenings on the chance of bettering herself. Sometimes his father woke up and, is, and as if quite unaware that he had been sleeping, said to his mother, what a lot of sewing you're doing today and at once fell asleep again, while the two women exchanged a tired smile. With a kind of mullishness, his father persisted in keeping his uniform on, on, even in the house. His dressing gown hung uselessly on its peg, and he slept fully dressed where he sat, as if he were ready for service at any moment, and even here only at the beck and call of his superior. As a result, his uniform, which was not brand new to start with, began to look dirty, despite all the loving care of the mother and sister to keep it clean, and Gregor often spent whole evenings gazing at the many greasy spots on the garment, gleaming with gold buttons always in a high state of polish, in which the old man sat sleeping in extreme discomfort, and yet quite peacefully. As soon as the clock struck ten, his mother tried to rouse his father with gentle words, and to persuade him after that to get into bed, for sitting there he could not have had... He could not have a proper sleep, and that was what he needed most, since he had to get on duty at six. But with the mullishness that had obsessed him since he became a bank messenger, he always insisted on staying longer at the table, although he regularly fell asleep again, and in the end, only with greatest trouble could be got up only with the greatest trouble could be got out of his armchair and into his bed. However insistently, Gregor's mother and sister kept urging him with gentle reminders. He would go on slowly shaking his head for a quarter of an hour, keeping his eyes shut, and refused to get to his feet. The mother plucked at his sleeve, whispering endearments in, in his ear. The sister left her lessons to come to her mother's help, but Gregor's father was not to be caught. He would only sink down deeper in his chair, not until the two women hoisted him up by the armpits did he open his eyes and look at them both one after the other, usually with the remark, this is a life, this is the peace and quiet of my old age. And leaning on the two of them, he would heave himself up with difficulty, as if he were a great burden to himself, suffer them to lead him as far as the door, and then wave them off and go on alone, while the mother abandoned her needlework and the sister her pen in order to run after him 
and help him further. Who could find time in this overworked and tired out family to bother about Gregor more than was absolutely needful? The household was reduced more and more. The servant girl was turned off. A gigantic bony charwoman with white hair flying round her head came in, came in morning and evening to do the rough work. Everything else was done by Gregor's mother, as well as great piles of sewing. Even various family ornaments, which his mother and sister used to wear with pride at parties and celebrations, had to be sold, as Gregor discovered of an evening from hearing them all discuss the prices obtained. But what they lamented most was the fact that they could not leave the flat, which was too big for their present circumstances, because they could not think of any way to shift Gregor. Yet Gregor saw well enough that consideration for him was not the main difficulty preventing the removal, for they could have easily shifted him in some suitable box with a few air holes in it. What really kept them from moving into another flat was rather their own complete hopelessness and the belief that they had been singled out for a misfortune such as never happened to such as had never happened to any of their relations or acquaintances. They fulfilled to the uttermost all that the world demands of poor people. The father fetched breakfast for the small clerks in the bank. The mother devoted her energy to making underwear for strangers. The sister trotted to and fro behind the counter at the behest of customers, but more than this they had not the strength to do. And the wound in Gregor's back began to nag at him afresh when his mother and sister, after getting his father into bed, came back again, left their work lying, drew close to each other, and sat cheek by cheek. When his mother pointed towards his room, said, Shut the door now, greet and he was left again in darkness. While next door, the women mingled their tears or perhaps sat dry-eyed, staring at the table. Gregor hardly slept at all, by night or by day. He was often haunted by the idea that the next time the door opened, he would take, he would take the family's affairs in hand take the family's affairs in hand again, just as he used to do. Once more, after his long interval, after this long interval, there appeared in his thoughts the figures of the chief and the chief clerk, the commercial travelers and their apprentices, and the apprentices, the porter who was so dull-witted, two or three friends in other firms, a chambermaid in one of the rural hotels, a sweet and fleeting memory, a cashier in a milliner's shop, whom he had wooed earnestly, but too slowly. They all appeared, together with strangers or people he had quite forgotten, but instead of helping him and his family, they were one and all unapproachable, and he was glad when they vanished. At other times, he would not be in the mood to bother about his family. He was only filled with rage at the way they were neglecting, neglecting him. And although he had no clear idea of what he might care to eat, he would make plans for getting into the larder or to take food that was, to take the food that was after all his due, even if he were not hungry. His sister had no longer took thought to bring him what might especially please him, but in the morning and at noon before she went to business hurriedly, pushed into his room with her foot any food that was available, and in the evening cleared it out again with one sweep of the broom, heedless of whether it had been merely tasted, or, as most frequently happened, left untouched. The cleaning of his room, which she now did always in the evenings, could not have been more hastily done. Streaks of dirt stretched along the walls. Here and there lay balls of dust and filth, at first, Gregor used to station himself in some particularly filthy corner when his sister arrived, in order to reproach her with it, so to speak, but he could have sat there for weeks without getting her to make any improvement. She could see the dirt as well as he did, but she had simply made up her mind to leave it alone, and yet, with a touchiness that was new to her, which seemed anyhow to have infected the whole family, she jealously guarded her claim to be the sole caretaker of Gregor's room. His mother once subjected his room to a thorough cleaning, which was achieved only by means of several buckets of water. All this dampness, of course, upset Gregor, too, and he lay widespread, sulky and motionless on the sofa. But she was well punished for it. Hardly had his sister noticed the changed aspect of his room that evening. That evening, then she rushed in high dudgeon into the living room, and despite it, the imploringly raised hands of her mother burst into a storm of weeping. While her parents, her father had of course been startled out of his chair, looked on at first in helpless amaze amazement, then they too began to go into action. The father reproached the mother on his right for not having left the cleaning of Gregor's room to his sister. Shrieked at the sister on his left that never again was she to be allowed to clean Gregor's room. 
while the mother tried to pull the father into his bedroom, since he was beyond himself with agitation. The sister, shaken with sobs, then beat upon the table with her small fists, and Gregor hissed loudly with rage, because not one of them thought of shutting the door to spare him such a spectacle, and so much noise. Still, even if the sister, exhausted by her daily work, had grown tired of looking after Gregor as she did formerly, there was no need for his mother's intervention or for Gregor's being neglected at all. The charwoman was there. This old widow, whose strong bony frame had enabled her to survive the worst a long life could offer, by no means recoiled from Gregor. Without being in the least curious, she had once by chance opened the door of his room, and at the sight of Gregor, who, taken by surprise, began to rush to and fro, although no one was chasing him, merely stood there with her arms folded. From that time she never failed to open his door a little for a moment, morning and evening, to have a look at him. At first she even used to call him to her, with words which apparently she took to be friendly, such as, Come along then, you old dung beetle, or look at the old dung beetle then. To such allocutions, Gregor made no answer, but stayed motionless where he was, as if the door had never been opened. Instead of being allowed to disturb him so senselessly, whenever the whim took her, she should rather have been ordered to clean out his room daily, that charwoman. Once, early in the morning, heavy rain was lashing on the window panes, perhaps a sign that spring was on the way. Gregor was so exa exasperated when she began addressing him again that he ran at her, as if to attack her, although slowly and feebly enough. But the charwoman, instead of showing fright, merely lifted high a chair that happened to be beside the door, and as she stood there with her mouth wide open, it was clear that she meant to shut it only when she brought the chair down on Gregor's back. So you're not coming any nearer? she asked, as Gregor turned away again, and quietly put the chair back into the corner. Gregor was now eating hardly anything. Only when he happened to pass the food laid out for him did he take a bit of something in his mouth as a pastime, kept it there for an hour at a time, and usually spat it out again. At first he thought it was chagrin over the state of his room that prevented him from eating, yet he soon got used to the various changes in his room. It had become a habit in the family to push into his room things that there was no room for elsewhere, and there were plenty of those now, plenty of these now, since one of the rooms had been let to three lodgers. These serious gentlemen, all three of them with full beards, as Gregor once observed through a crack in the door, had a passion for order, not only in their room, but since they were now members of the household, in all arrangements, especially in the kitchen, superfluous, not to say dirty objects, they could not bear. Besides, they brought with them most of the furnishings they needed. For this reason, many things could be dispensed with, that it was no use trying to sell, but that should not be thrown away either. All of them found their way into Gregor's room the ash can likewise, and the kitchen garbage can. Anything that was not needed for the moment was simply flung into Gregor's room by the charwoman who did everything in a hurry. Fortunately, Gregor usually saw only the object, whatever it was, and the hand that held it. Perhaps she intended to take the things away again as time and opportunity offered, or to collect them until she could throw them all out in a heap, but in fact they just lay wherever she happened to throw them, except when Gregor pushed his way through the junk heap and shifted it somewhat, at first out of necessity because he had not enough room to crawl, but later with increasing enjoyment, although after such excursions being sad and weary to death, he would lie motionless for hours. And since the lodgers often ate their supper at home in the common living room, the living room door stayed shut many an evening. Yet Gregor reconciled himself quite easily to the shutting of the door, for often enough on evenings when it was opened he had disregarded it entirely and lain in the darkest corner of his room quite unnoticed by the family, but on one occasion the charwoman left the door open a little and it stayed ajar even when the lodgers came in for supper and the lamp was lit. They set themselves at the top end of the table, where formerly Gregor and his father and mother had eaten their meals, unfolded their napkins, and took knife and fork in hand. At once his mother appeared at the other doorway with a dish of meat and Close behind her, his sister with a dish of potatoes piled high. The food steamed with a thick vapor. The lodgers bent over the food set before them as if to scrutinize it before eating. In fact, the man in the middle, who seemed to pass for an authority with the other two, cut a piece of the meat as it lay on the dish, obviously to discover if it were tender or should be sent back to the kitchen. He showed satisfaction, and Gregor's mother and sister, who had been watching anxiously, breathed freely and began to smile. The family itself took its meals in the kitchen. Nonetheless, Gregor's father came into the living room before going into the kitchen, and with one prolonged bow, cap in hand, made a round of the table. The lodgers all stood up and murmured something in their beards. When they were alone again, they ate their food in almost complete silence. It seemed remarkable to Gregor that among the various noises coming from the table, he could always distinguish the sound of their masticating teeth, as if, it, as if this were a sign to Gregor that one needed teeth in order to eat, and that with 
toothless jaws, even the finest mistake. Even the finest make one could do nothing. <laughs> and that with toothless jaws, even of the finest make, one could do nothing. I'm hungry enough, said Gregor sadly to himself, but not for that kind of food. How these lodgers are stuffing themselves, and here I am dying of starvation. On that very evening, during the whole of his time there, Gregor could not remember ever having heard the violin. The sound of violin playing came from the kitchen. The lodgers had already finished their supper. The one in the middle had brought out a newspaper and given the other two a page apiece, and now they were leaning back at ease, reading and smoking. When the violin began to play, they pricked up their ears, got to their feet, and went on tiptoe to the hall door, where they stood huddled together. Their movements must have been heard in the kitchen, for Gregor's father called out. Is the violin playing disturbing you, gentlemen? It can be stopped at once. On the contrary, said the middle lodger. Could not Fräulein Samsa come and play in this room beside us, where it is much more convenient and comfortable? Oh, certainly, cried Gregor's father, as if he were the violin player. The lodgers came back into the living room and waited. Presently, Gregor's father arrived with the music stand, his mother carrying the music and his sister with the violin. His sister quietly made everything ready to start playing. His parents, who had never let rooms before, and so had an exaggerated idea of the courtesy due to lodgers, did not venture to sit down on their own chairs. His father leaned against the door, the right hand thrust between two buttons of his livery coat, which was formally buttoned up, but his mother was offered a chair by one of the lodgers, and, since she left the chair chest where he had happened to put it, sat down in a corner to one side. Gregor's sister began to play. The father and mother from either side intently watched the movements of her hands. Gregor, attracted by the playing, ventured to move forward a little until his head was actually inside the living room. He felt hardly any surprise at his growing lack of consideration for the others. There had been a time when he prided himself on being considerate, and yet, just on this occasion, he had more reason than ever to hide himself, since, owing to the amount of dust which lay thick in his room and rose into the air at the slightest movement, he too was covered with dust. Fluff and hair and remnants of food trailed with him, caught on his back and along his sides. His indifference to everything was much too great for him to turn on his back and scrape himself clean on the carpet, as once he had done several times a day, and in spite of his condition, no shame deterred him from advancing a little over to the spotless, shore, the spotless floor of the living room. To be sure, no one was aware of him. The family was entirely observed in the violin playing. The lodgers, however, who first of all had stationed themselves hands in pockets to much too close behind the music stand so that they could so that they could all have read the music, which must have bothered his sister, had soon retreated to the window, half whispering with down downbent heads, and stayed there while his father turned an anxious eye on them. Indeed, they were making it more than obvious that they had been disappointed in their expectation of hearing good or enjoyable violin playing, that they had had more than enough of the performance, and only out of courtesy suffered a continuing a continued disturbance of their peace. From the way they all kept blowing the smoke of their cigars high in the air through nose and mouth, one could divine their irritation, and yet Gregor's sister was playing so beautifully. Her face leaned sideways intently and sadly. Her eyes followed the notes of music. Gregor crawled a little further forward and lowered his head to the ground so that it might be possible for his eyes to meet hers. Was he an animal that music had such an effect upon him? He felt as if the way were opening before him to the unknown nourishment he craved. He was determined to push forward till he reached his sister, to pull at her skirt, and so let her know that she was to come into his room with her violin, for no one here appreciated her playing as he would appreciate it. He would never let her out of his room, at least not so long as he lived. His frightful appearance would become, for the first time, useful to him. He would watch all the doors of his room at once and spit at intruders, but his sister should need no constraint. She should stay with him of her own free will. She should sit beside him on the sofa, bend down her ear to him, and hear him confide that he had had the firm intention of sending her to the conservatorium, and that, but for his mishap last Christmas, surely Christmas was long past, he would have announced it to everybody without allowing a single objection. After this confession, his sister would be so touched that she would burst into tears, and Gregor would then raise himself to her shoulder and kiss her on the neck, which, now that she went to business, she kept free of any ribbon or collar. Mr. Sam, sir, 
cried the middle lodger to Gregor's father, and pointed without wasting any more words at Gregor, now working himself slowly forwards. The violin fell silent. The middle lodger first smiled to his friends with a shake of the head, and then looked at Gregor again. Instead of driving Gregor out, his father seemed to think it more needful to begin by soothing down the lodgers, although they were not at all agitated, and apparently found Gregor more entertaining than the violin playing. He hurried towards them, and, spreading out his arm, tried to urge them back into their own room, and at the same time to block their view of Gregor. They now began to be a little angry. Really a little angry. One could not tell whether because of the old man's behavior or because it had just dawned on them that all unwittingly they had they had such a neighbor as Gregor next door. They demanded, uh, they demanded explanations of his father. They waved their arms like him, tugged uneasily at their beards, and only with reluctance backed towards their room. Meanwhile, Gregor's sister, who stood there as if lost while her playing was so abruptly broken off, came to life again, pulled herself together all at once after standing for a while holding a violin and bow and nervously hanging hands and staring at her music, pushed her violin into the lap of her mother, who was still sitting in her chair, fighting asthmatically for breath, for breath, and ran into the lodger's room, to which they were now being shepherded by her father rather more quickly than before. One could see the pillows and blankets on the beds flying under her accustomed fingers and being laid in order. Before the lodgers had actually reached their room, she had finished making the beds and slipped out. The old man seemed once more to be so possessed by his mullish self-assertiveness that he was forgetting all the respect he should show his lodgers, should should show to his lodgers. He kept driving them on and them and driving them on until the very door of the bedroom the middle lodger stamped his foot loudly on the floor and so brought him to a halt. I beg to announce, said the lodger, lifting one hand and looking also at Gregor's mother and sister, that because of the disgusting conditions prevailing in this household and family, he there, here he spat on the floor with emphatic brevity. I give you notice on the spot. Naturally, I won't pay you a penny for the days I have lived here. On the contrary, I shall consider bringing an action for damages against you, based on claims, believe me, that will be easily susceptible of proof. He ceased and stared straight in front of him, as if he expected something. In fact, his two friends at once rushed into the breach with these words. Uh, and we, too, g give notice on that spot. Give notice on the spot. Uh, on that, he seized the door handle and shut the door with a slam. Gregor's father, groping with his hands, staggered forward and fell into his chair. It looked as if he were stretching himself there for his ordinary evening nap, but the marked jerkings of his head, which was as if uncontrollable, showed that he was far from asleep. Gregor had simply stayed quietly all the time on the spot where the lodgers had espied him. Disappointment at the failure of his plan, perhaps also the weakness arising from extreme hunger, made it impossible for him to move. He feared with a fair degree of certainty that at any moment the general tension would discharge itself in a combined attack upon him as he lay waiting. He did not react even to the noise made by the violin as it fell off his mother's lap from under her trembling fingers and gave out a resonant note. My dear parents, said his sister, slapping her hand on the table by way of an introduction. Things can't go on like this. Perhaps you don't realize that, but I do. I won't utter my brother's name in the presence of this creature, and so all I say is we must try to get rid of it. We've tried to look after it and to put up with it as far as is humanly possible, and I don't think anyone could reproach us in the slightest. She is more than right, said Gregor's father to himself. His mother who was still choking for lack of breath, began to cough hollowly into her hand with a wild look in her eyes. His sister rushed over to her and held her forehead. His father's thoughts seemed to have lost their vagueness at Greet's words. He sat more upright, fingering his service cap and that lay among the plates still lying on the table from the lodger's supper, and from time to time looked at the still form of Gregor. We must try to get rid of it. His sister now said explicitly to her father, since her mother was coughing too much to hear a word. It will be the death of both of you. I can see that coming. When one has to work as hard as we do, all of us, one can't stand this continual torment at home on top of it. At least I can't stand it any longer. And she burst into such a passion of sobbing that her tears dropped on her mother's face, where she wiped them off me uh, mechanically. My dear said the old man sympathetically, and with evident understanding. 
but what can we do? Gregor's sister merely shrugged her shoulders to indicate the feeling of helplessness that had now overmastered her during her weeping fit, in contrast to her former confidence. If he could understand us, said her father, half questioningly, Greet, still sobbing, vehemently waved a hand to show how unthinkable that was. If he could understand us, repeated the old man, shutting his eyes to consider his daughter's conviction that the understanding was impossible, then perhaps we might come to some agreement with him. But as it is, he must go, cried Gregor's sisters. Cried Gregor's sister. That's the only solution, father. You must just try to get rid of the idea that this is Gregor. The fact that we've believed it for so long is the root of all our trouble. But how can it be Gregor? If this were Gregor, he would have realized long ago that human beings can't live with such a creature, and he'd have gone away on his own accord. Then we wouldn't have any bother. Then he wouldn't. Then we wouldn't have any brother. But we'd be able to go on living and keep his memory and honor. As it is, this creature persecutes us, drives away our lodgers, obviously wants the whole apartment to himself, and would have us all sleep in the gutter. Just look, father, she shrieked all at once. He's had it again. And in an access of panic that was quite incomprehensible to Gregor, she even quitted her mother, literally thrusting the chair from her as if she would rather sacrifice her mother than stay so near to Gregor, and rushed behind her father, who also rose up, being simply upset by her agitation, and half spread his arms out as if to protect her. Yet Gregor had not the slightest intention of frightening anyone, far less his sister. He had only begun to turn around in order to crawl back to his room. But it was certainly a startling operation to watch, since because of his disabled condition, he could not execute the difficult turning movements except by lifting his head and then bracing it against the floor over and over again. He paused to look round. His good intentions seemed to have been recognized. The alarm had only been momentary. Now they were all watching him in melancholy silence. His mother lay in her chair, her legs stiffly outstretched and pressed together, her eyes almost closing for sheer weariness. His father and his sister were sitting beside each other, his sister's arm around the old man's neck. Perhaps I can go on turning around now, thought Gregor, and began his labors again. He could not stop himself from panting with the effort and had to pause now and then to take breath, nor did anyone harass him. He was left entirely to himself. When he had completed the turnaround, he began at once to crawl straight back. He was amazed at the distance separating him from his room, and could not understand how in this weak state he had managed to accomplish the same journey so recently, almost without remarking it. Intent on crawling as fast as possible, he barely noticed that not a single word, not an ejaculation from his family, <laughs> interfered with his progress. Only when he was already in the doorway did he turn his head around, not completely, for his neck muscles were getting stiff, but enough to see that nothing had changed behind him except that his sister had risen to her feet. His last glance fell upon his mother, who was not quite overcome by sleep. Hardly was he well inside his room when the door was hastily pushed shut, bolted and locked. The sudden noise in his rear startled him so much that his little legs gave beneath him. It was his sister who had shown such haste. She had been standing ready, waiting, and had made a light spring forward. Gregor had not even heard her coming, and she cried at last to her parents as she turned the key in the lock. And what now? said Gregor to himself, looking round in the darkness. Soon he made the discovery that he was now unable to stir a limb. This did not surprise him. Rather, it seemed unnatural that he should ever actually have been able to move on these feeble little legs, otherwise he felt relatively comfortable. True, his whole body was aching, but it seemed that the pain was gradually growing less and would finally pass away. The rotting apple in his back and the inflamed area around it, all covered with soft dust, already hardly troubled him. Already hardly troubled him. <laughs> he thought of his family with tenderness and love. The decision that he must Disappear was one that he held to even more strongly than his sister. If that were possible, in this state of vacant and peaceful medication, meditation, <laughs> he remained until the tower clock struck three in the morning. The first broadening of light in the world outside the window entered his consciousness once more. Then his head sank to the floor of its own accord, and from his nostrils came the last faint flicker of his breath. 
When the charwoman arrived early in the morning, what between her strength and her impatience, she slammed all the doors so loudly, never mind how often, she had been begged not to do so, that no one in the whole apartment could enjoy any quiet sleep after her arrival. She noticed nothing unusual as she took her customary peep into Gregor's room. She thought he was lying motionless on purpose, pretending to be in the sulks. She credited him with every kind of intelligence. Since she happened to have the long-handled broom in her hand, she tried to tickle him up with it from the doorway. When that, too, produced no reaction, she felt provoked and poked at him a little harder. And only when he had when she had pushed him along the floor without meeting any resistance was her attention aroused. It did not take her long to establish the truth of the matter, and her eyes widened. She let out a whistle, yet did not waste much time over it, but tore open the door of the Samsa's bedroom and yelled in the darkness at the top of her voice, Just look at this! It's dead! It's lying here dead and done for! Mr. and Mrs. Samsa started up in their double bed, and before they realized the nature of the charwoman's announcement, had some difficulty in overcoming the shock, the shock of it. But then they got out of bed quickly, one on either side, Mr. Samsa throwing a blanket over his shoulders, Mrs. Samsa in nothing but her nightgown. In this array, they entered Gregor's room. Meanwhile, the door of the living room opened, too, where Greet had been sleeping since the advent of the lodger. She was completely dressed as if she had not been to bed which seemed to be confirmed also by the paleness of her face. Dead, said Mrs. Samsa, looking questioningly at the charwoman, although she could have had, although she could have investigated for herself, and the fact was obvious enough without investigation. I should say so, said the charwoman, proving her words by pushing Gregor's corpse a long way to one side with a broomstick. Mrs. Samsa made a movement as if to stop her, but checked it. Well, said Mr. Samsa, now thanks be to God. He crossed himself and the three women followed his example. Greet, whose eyes never left the corpse, said, Just see how thin he was. It's such a long time since he's eaten anything. The food came out again just as it went in. Indeed, Gregor's body was completely flat and dry, as could only now be seen when it was no longer supported by the legs and nothing prevented one from looking closely at it. Come in beside us, Greet, for a little while, said Mrs. Samso with a tremulous smile and Greet, not without looking back at the corpse, followed her parents into their bedroom. The charwoman shut the door and opened the window wide. Although it was so early in the morning, a certain softness was perceptible in the fresh air. After all, it was already the end of March. Whoa. The three lodgers emerged from their rooms and were surprised to see no breakfast. They had been forgotten. Where's our breakfast? said the middle lodger peevishly to the charwoman, but she put her finger to her lips and hastily, without a word, indicated by gestures that they should go into Gregor's room. They did so and stood, their hands in the pockets of their somewhat shabby coats, around Gregor's corpse in the room where it was now fully light. At the door of the Samsa's bedroom, at that, the door of the Samsa's bedroom opened, and Mr. Samsa appeared in his uniform, his wife on one arm, his daughter on the other. They all looked a little as if they had been crying. From time to time, Greet hid her face on her father's arm. Leave my house at once, said Mr. Samsa, and pointed to the door without disengaging himself from the women. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that, said the middle lodger, taken somewhat aback with a feeble smile. The two others put their hands behind them and kept rubbing them together as if in gleeful expectation of a fine set to which of a fine set to in which they were bound to come off the winners. A set to being an argument, I suppose. I mean just what I say, answered Mr. Samsa, and advanced in a straight line with his two companions towards the lodger. He stood his ground at first quietly, looking at the floor as if his thoughts were taking a new pattern in his head. Then let us go by all means, he said, and looked up at Mr. Samsa, as if in sudden access of humility, he were expecting some renewed sanction for this decision. Mr. Samsa merely nodded briefly once or twice with meaningful eyes. Upon that, the lodger really did go with long strides into the hall. His two friends had been listening and had quite stopped rubbing their hands for some moments and now went scuttling after him, as if afraid that Mr. Samson might get into the hall before them and cut them off from their leader. 
and the hall they all three took their hats from the from the rack their sticks from the umbrella stand bowed in silence and quitted the apartment with a suspiciousness which proved quite unfounded mr samsa and the two women followed them out to the landing leaning over the banister they watched the three figures slowly but surely going down the long stairs vanishing from sight at a certain turn of the staircase on every floor and coming into view again after a moment or so the more they dwindled the more the Samsa family's interest in them dwindled, and when a butcher's boy met them and passed them on the stairs, coming up proudly with a tray on his head, Mr. Samsa and the two women soon left the landing, and as if a burden had been lifted from them, went back into their apartment. They decided to spend this day in resting and going for a stroll. They had not been only deserved such a respite from work, but absolutely needed it, and so they sat down at the table and wrote three notes of excuse. Mr. Samsa to his board of management, Mrs. Samsa to her employer, and greet to the head of her firm. While they were writing, the chairwoman came in to say that she was going now, since her morning's work was finished. At first they only nodded without looking up, but as she kept hovering there, they eyed her irritably. Well, said Mr. Samsa, the charwoman stood grinning in the doorway as if she had good news to impart the family, but meant not to say a word unless properly questioned. The small ostrich feather standing upright on her hat, which had annoyed Mr. Samsa ever since she was engaged, was waving gaily in all directions. Well, what is it then? asked Mrs. Samsa, who obtained more respect from the charwoman than the others. Oh, said the charwoman, giggling so amiably that she could not at once continue. <laughs> Just this. You don't need to bother about how to get rid of the thing next door. It's been seen to already. Mrs. Samsa and greet bent over their letters again, as if preoccupied. Mr. Samsa, who perceived that she was eager to begin describing it all in detail, stopped her with a decisive hand. But since she was not allowed to tell her story, she remembered the great hurry she was in, being obviously deeply huffed by everybody, she said, whirling off violently, and departed with a frightful slamming of doors. She'll be given notice tonight, said Mr. Samsa, but neither from his wife nor his daughter did he get any answer. For the charwoman seemed to have shattered again the composure they had barely achieved. They rose, went to the window, and stayed there, clasping each other tight. Mr. Samson turned in his chair to look at them and quietly observed them for a little. Then he called out, Come along now, do, let bygones be bygones, and you might have some consideration for me. The two of them complied at once, hastened to him, and caressed him, and quickly finished their letters. Then they all three left the apartment together, which was more than they had done for months and went by tram into the open country outside the town. The tram, in which they were the only passengers, was filled with warm sunshine. Leaning comfortably back in their seats, they canvassed their prospects for the future, and it appeared, on closer inspection, that these were not at all bad, for the jobs they had got, which so far they had never really discussed with each other, were all three admirable, <laughs> were all three admirable and likely to lead to better things later on. The greatest immediate improvement in their condition would, of course, arise from moving to another house. They wanted to take a smaller and cheaper, but also better situated and more easily run apartment than the one they had, than the one they had, which Gregor had selected. While they were thus conversing, it struck both Mr. and Mrs. Samsa almost at the same moment, as they became aware of their daughter's increasing vivacity, that in spite of all the sorrow of recent times, which had made her cheeks pale, she had bloomed into a pretty girl with a good figure. They grew quieter and half unconsciously exchanged glances of complete agreement, having come to the conclusion that it would soon be time to find a good husband for her, and it was like a confirmation of their new dreams and excellent intentions that at the end of their journey their daughter sprang to her feet first and stretched her young body. Ends with the stretching of a young body. Lovely. That is two hours and 23 minutes for those two short stories. What do we have left? The Penal Colony will be the next, followed by The Great Wall of China. I'm sure that'll be free of controversy. And then A Country Doctor and an old manuscript. And then a fratricide. I think we already read that. Ah, yes. So after a country doctor, that will have been all of it. That is roughly 60 more pages. Why not? Thanks for watching, listening, falling asleep. <laughs>